Hi, I'm Steve Thompson, president of Emory Thompson Machinery, and I'd like to welcome you to our factory and our presentation today. Uh, with me is uh, tie-dye Jeff, Jeff Marco, and Rod Oranger uh, from iRice Company Flavors, and we're going to show you how to make Italian ices and gelato and all sorts of good things. So why don't we get started, and uh, we'll reconvene uh, near lunch to have a sit-down and discussion. Oh, sure. yeah, this is just to show you how cold it is here in Florida. It was 30 degrees this morning. This is uh, early January, and we're, we're just not used to this kind of cold. And I want to thank all you Yankees for bringing it down here. But you can take it back with you after your vacation. This is a 12-quart machine. The uh, 12 and the 24 are identical machines as far as physical size. The only difference is in the barrel depth. The um, 24 is twice as deep. And basically what a batch freezer is, this is one here, that's a batch freezer. That's the old fashioned kind that I was using when I was growing up, um, you know, around the time of Ben Franklin. And uh, the way a batch freezer works is you have the outer cylinder and you have the inner cylinder and you put the um, dairy products into the inner cylinder and then you surround the outer cylinder with rock salt and ice. Ice melts and freezes at 32 degrees, but by adding the rock salt, we can get much colder temperatures. And then you put all your dairy ingredients in here, milk, cream, sugar, skim milk, uh, vanilla, strawberries, whatever you want to make. And then you turn this crank for 45 minutes. It's a very old, primitive way, and that's what my grandfather, Emery Thompson, was working with back in 1903. Uh, today, we're making the exact same kind of ice cream except instead of a vertical barrel, we are horizontal uh, because with a vertical barrel, whatever you put in the top, Newton's law, is going to fall to the bottom. So we don't want M&M ice cream that's heavy concentrated with M&Ms in the bottom and not much up top. By turning it horizontal, everything will mix. Instead of the rock salt and ice, we're using Freon gas, an environmentally friendly propellant, same as what's in your refrigerator, and that's going to get the walls of the machine very cold and then instead of the old beater with wood paddles, uh, we're using some very high-tech polymer resin blades. Uh, the nice thing about these blades is while other people have to change theirs every six months, these are good for about six years. And at five years and 11 months, they're still scraping as good as the day they were made because they're spring-loaded. So no matter how old these blades are, when you put them into the machine, they're still going to scrape against the walls. Now, I want to make this instructional for you, so um, one thing that you want to know, it's very few parts, but when we look at this, that's my broker calling, I hear the, it said buy shell. Um, this blade, I'm not talking about the long part, but the, the north and the south as they call it. This end is cut off like we took a hacksaw on a 90 degree angle, and this end is curved to match the curvature of the barrel back here. So when you put this together, you just want to, it's the only trick to the machine, you just want to make sure that the curved end is to the back. And the back is back there. The drive shaft is back in here, and this is what causes everything to spin. And that's a stainless steel shaft, and this gets lubricated with a product called Petrogel or Taylor Company has the same product called Taylor Lube. Uh, it's actually just a fancy glorified Vaseline. So you can go to the supermarket or to the, the pharmacy and buy a product just like this. And we're just going to put a little bit on there. This is the only lubrication point on the whole machine. And the whole maintenance on the machine is once every five or seven years replace the blades and every day before you make ice cream lubricate the drive shaft. Once this is lubricated, you can run for eight hours. So that just slides into the back. Any excess Vaseline is going to be pushed forward. Do you have paper towels? I have some. Oh, great. Thanks, Rod. Uh, any excess is going to push forward. And so I'm just going to go in here and wipe that off. And then that's ready to go. So I put the dasher in. All I do is check that the blades are curved in the back. I'm just going to squeeze them together a little bit, put it in, and I'm not reaching deep into the machine. It's not necessary. 
I'm just turning it around until it picks up on the dasher. Now when I think it's up on the dasher, I'm going to give it an extra turn just to make sure that it's all the way in. And then this little bushing goes on the front. It's got a little stainless steel piece that sticks up. And that goes in. And then we're going to make sure the cover knobs are out of the way. Other companies use uh, a very nice looking system called a cam action. It's just one rod that goes over and down and locks. It looks really nice but they don't work. After five years, they break, they leak. Uh, we've been using the uh, knobs like this for 109 years and they work extremely well. Uh, it's solid. If you have the luxury of getting on board a, a Navy destroyer or a submarine, uh, you're not gonna find any cam action on the uh, doors. You're gonna find uh, bolts that are locking it up tight because they want a solid fit. Everything on the Emory Thompson fits perfectly. So if you're having trouble putting something together, you're doing it wrong and start over. Just hand tight. You don't need to muscle them. You don't need to take out a hammer. You let the gasket do the work. Make sure that here's the gate. That's where the ice cream's going to come out. Make sure the gate is closed. I've had lots of times on live cameras that uh, I'm pouring the product in and I'm making a cherry ice and it's going all over the floor and I'm looking to see, oh my gosh, did I not get the door closed? Why is it leaking? Well, I left the gate open. It's, it's, you'll do it. I trust, trust me, you will. Close the gate. That's all you have to do. This is ready to go. And you can always put something underneath the spout. I never spill. Rod says you could put something underneath, but I never spill. Just, Question. Just a thought. Is this the same uh, as the C CB3? Yes, the CB3, the question is, is this the same as the CB350? Um, this is the CB350 over here, and the only difference <laughs> is that it's, uh, the door also has the four knobs, but it's uh, completely removable. And all my machines use the same materials and the same designs, and they all last on average 45 years. They, they actually last a lot longer. We have a lot of machines out there that are 80 and 90 years, but you have to pick a number somewhere. So 45 is the average. So this door just comes straight off like that. Same design. I'm going to just put that over here for a minute. And then it's got the same design dasher. Pulls straight out. And there you go with the curved blades in the back. This one, the drive shaft is attached and they just come off like that. Everything is dishwasher safe. You can put it right in the dishwasher and when you go to put it together, you just squeeze it together and put it in. And then give it a turn, make sure it's all the way back in there and then you're ready to go. Same thing with the CB200, exact same design. All right, I'm gonna sanitize this. Because I've been touching it all, uh, bacteria has grown up on the machine. Uh, if we made ice cream daily, uh, last night we finished making ice cream, we took the parts and we put them out on a table to air dry and then we put it back together and we want to sanitize it. The simplest way to sanitize a machine, if you're you know, off in a foreign land and you don't have access to a commercial sanitizer, a cap, not a cup, a cap full of Clorox bleach to a gallon of water is an excellent sanitizer. Just a cap full into a gallon. We're going to use a commercial sanitizer, and the company is called Sterachine, and Sterachine is kind enough to uh, supply us with packets of sanitizer that uh, come in every machine when you get it, so you'll remember uh, what the name was. But uh, Sterachine, uh, you can go on the website and buy it. It comes in a, a green uh, plastic jug, and you just it comes with a little scoop, and you just put a scoop into water, and you're ready to go. So let me get some water going here. I've got that. Boy, I'm efficient today. I've already got it here. Not your first rodeo, is it, Steve? Well, I had the chauffeur come in and do it. So that we'd be ready. Now, if you, if you measure the water carefully and you measure the sanitizer carefully, uh, it'll be perfect. I'm not good at measuring, so I kind of wing it. Um, I tend to use less than more. Let's see, I need a spatula. There you go, bud. Thank you. And this dissolves very quickly. And this is going to kill all bacteria in the machine. It's also what they call a milkstone remover. Dairy product 
uh, if everything isn't washed up nice and clean, leaves a, a film that can get uh, crusty on your parts. It's, it's very thin and it takes a long time to build up. And it's called Milkstone. This product removes it. So uh, to me, it's a perfect product. I found that when you're pouring into a batch freezer, if you rest your bucket on the lid, you're going to spill. If you raise it up a little bit, you probably won't spill. Now, let me just do this. And just to make you feel bad, I only have one working eye. And as you can see, I'm not having any trouble pouring this in. So uh, you will get good at it. It's a very large opening, so it's not hard. That's the beauty of the Emery Thompson is the openings are so large that you can put whole nuts, cookies, candies, everything right in the machine. You'll see me when we make the uh, grape nuts banana ice cream later. I'm going to take whole bananas and just drop it in. Not another machine on the market that you can do that with. Also, they'll void your warranty because their beaters are so flimsy that they'll twist out. With Emery Thompson, everything goes in. So I've got that in there. Now I'm only running water in here. There's no dairy to freeze. There's no sugar to freeze for Italian ice. Uh, there's no gelato uh, blend in here. So if I was to turn on the refrigeration and get the barrel cold, it'll make a giant ice cube. And so I'm just going to spin it. I'm not going to refrigerate it. So I turn that on. This is the infinite overrun control, something I invented uh, now coming up on 12 years ago. And it's yet to be copied by anyone, even though it's not patented. Um, it is exclusive to us and it allows me to, right now I'm at full speed, which is where I would make Italian ices, or if you're from Philadelphia, they call it Italian water ice. Uh, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, they called Greek ices. The, the reason they called Greek ices is because uh, seven Greek brothers from Brooklyn left Brooklyn, went down to Birmingham, and they said, why should we call it Italian? We're Greek. So they called Greek ices. In Hawaii, it's Hawaiian ices. That's run at full speed. To, on this machine, 231, 234 in that range of revolutions per minute. Um, I can slow that down to anything I want. So I can make a, uh, a Breyers type ice cream, which is high air content, and we put them in business. I can make haagen and Ben and & Jerry, which is a low air content. Um, we put them in business. You can make any gelatos uh, better than you know any machines out of Italy uh, by just slowing it down to about 140 revolutions. And on the countertop, you can take it even slower and make uh, frozen custard. So the second this sterile water hit all the parts, everything was clean. But your health department is going to say run it anywhere from 30 seconds to three minutes, and that's something you have to. Uh, follow the directions of your health department. Whatever they say is what you do. When we take ice cream or ices out of here today, we're going to leave this spinning. We'll turn off the refrigeration over here, but we'll leave it spinning and it's going to push all the ice cream out of the machine. But the water is so loose uh, that if I open this gate right now, the first 30 people in the front row are going to get a bath. So we turn off the beater. Open that up and that will drain out. The barrel, uh, you want to have a level floor, but the barrel has a slight pitch forward so that any water left in it is going to come out no matter what. If I followed the directions exactly, uh, I would be finished. I could start making ice cream. But since I don't follow directions, I'm going to throw another rinse through here. Uh, I've had some health inspectors tell me, and again, I got to tell you, Health inspectors, they rule the world, so you have to do what they say, whether you like it or not. I had a health inspector tell me that by adding water into the machine, as I'm going to do right now, I was recontaminating it. And I said, well, what do you think Italian ice is? I'm going to go over here and get tap water. What do you think I'm drinking? Your, your cleanliness is only as good as your water supply. So I don't buy that, but then again, it's a health department guy and you got to do what they say. I like the uh, Sterachine green bucket because it's separate from everything else in here that's white. And I'm going to set it aside here so that anything that comes in contact with the ice cream, a spatula, put it in there, it's now sanitized. I'm going to throw chips into the ice cream. I can go like that and I am cleaner than I was. Uh, I also keep hand, hand sanitizer around too. It's flu season and you want to keep everything just as sterile as you can. So making sure, remember I had that gate open. Make sure the gate's closed. 
and I'll just get a little bit of water here to do a final rinse and then I'm going to turn it over to Rod who's going to show you how to make uh, one of the most popular flavors in the country right now, salted caramel. And I, I can't wait to try it. I'm excited. Rod has a very colorful history and a long history. Um, he's under an assumed name, the feds are looking for him. But uh, he really knows the flavor business and I think you're gonna get a kick out of hearing what he has to say. So I'll take a back seat and work for Rod for this next flavor. Oh, thanks, Steve. Well, uh, as you can see, Steve can never survive in corporate America. I'm pretty much the same. I don't play well in the sandbox with others, which is why when I left Oranger, which was my family's business, I joined another small family business called I Rice Company. Um, small family business, entrepreneurship is the way to go in my mind. Um, so I've been in this business uh, over, oh, if I tell you, I'd be dating myself, wouldn't I? Over a year. <laughs> 30, 30 some odd years I've been in this business. Uh, my, my grandfather founded Oranger Manufacturing Company in 1918 selling flavors on a push cart in downtown Boston to confectioners. My father and my uncle uh, took the business over and uh, ran the business into the early 80s when I acquired the business. Uh, subsequently sold the business in the late 80s to Concord Foods. Uh, and then ran the Concord Foods Oranger division for 23 years. I left Concord Foods two and a half years ago and joined I Rice, a small family business out of Philadelphia. I Rice is renowned for their reputation in water ice bases. They basically invented water ice. If you go into Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey, everybody's selling water ice on every corner, as these gentlemen right here can substantiate. Uh, Water ice is a very simple product to make. It's a stabilization system, water, and flavor. That's it. Uh, the cost is minimal, profit margins are substantial. Uh, Steve loves the Italian ice and water ice business because uh, it's, it's keeping him afloat right now. Is it not, Steve? Well, it does uh, help pay for the Bentley and a few other things. <laughs> uh, the great thing about Italian ice, or you can tell Rod's got... Uh, some Philadelphia background because he calls it water ice. The thing about Italian ice, which we'll be making next, is it's just sugar, water, and flavor. It's so inexpensive that you can get yourself into business uh, for very little money, uh, which is fantastic. We'll talk about that on the ices, but here's your dairy product uh, that you're gonna use. Uh, this is a blend that came from the dairy yesterday. It came out of the cow two days ago. It is milk, cream, and a secret ingredient, skim milk. Skim milk is heavy cream with all the fat removed. So it's heavy cream with all the good stuff still in it. So milk, cream, skim milk, and sugar are what's in here. And the uh, dairy went out to the farmers and said, we want all the stuff that you milk from the cows and um, we'll bring it back to the plant and our dairy scientists will separate it into milk, cream, skim milk, and then we'll re-blend it into this product. And it's always been refrigerated, it's, it's been handled by specialists, and it's put into these bags uh, called a bladder, and it's delivered to you refrigerated and fresh. And this is usually good for, for about 10 days to two weeks. Uh, because I'm doing these courses, I also freeze it, it freezes very well. And um, this is my fresh ingredients. We, I tell people, and I'm, I'll turn it back to you right away, but I tell people we make better gelato here in the United States than they can possibly make over in Italy. Because although the Italians would try to try to tell you differently, gelato is nothing more than milk, cream, skim milk, and sugar. That's what gelato is. It's a lower fat than what we're running. Even though what we're running here today under Jeff's guidance is the lowest fat content you can run in the United States and still legally call it ice cream because it makes a great product and we know what, what ice cream is all about is the flavor. But the Italians would have you use this. This is a bag of powder it's, and it's the same as this. The difference is there are no cows in Italy, dairy cows. There's beef cows but there's no dairy cows. The cows are on the pampas in Argentina. So in Argentina, they milk the cows and then they take the dairy product and they put it through a series of screens called a spray dryer and they blow it through these screens and turn it into a powder. 
It's then shipped by the tanker load to Bologna, Italy, where they mix it together and they put it in these nice foil bags, ship it to the Port of Elizabeth, ship it to you in Akron, Ohio, and then you have to reconstitute it with uh, water to turn it into this. So that's why I can make the claim very easily that we make better gelato here in the United States than they do in Italy. Because do you want something that started off in Argentina and has done more traveling and seen more countries than I have, or something that came out of the cow two days ago? I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. This is what I call fresh. You could make this on your own, um, but it gets complicated because you would go to the supermarket and buy it. And when you buy heavy cream in little containers like that, you're going to be paying a premium for it. Uh, also, the health department gets involved, as they always do, and uh, it just makes it more complicated when you can work with a, a fabulous product like this put together by dairy scientists. So it's all yours. I can't wait to try it. Thanks, Steve. What's, what's the uh, butterfat content of this mix? 10%. 10%. Yeah. Down Which here is... in Florida, we run low fat contents because if you eat ice cream when it's 100 degrees out and 100% humidity, you drop dead in the parking lot. And it really looks bad for business to have people <laughs> dropping dead in the parking lot. So by running a lower, because a high fat product, you eat a filet mignon at Ruth Christ in Tampa and then walk outside in the middle of August, you know, you're going to drop dead there too. It's just too high fat for the body to take. It upsets your stomach. So down in the south, uh, Rod's from Boston. Down in the south, we run these low-fat products. and uh, I can use that, by the way. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. It was bad enough that you said that my Thank hair you. looked grayer this time. But that's okay. It's all yours. Uh, so it's interesting that, um, you know, lower butterfat, of course, that makes sense. In the heat, you want, you want the lower butterfat. In the north, where they sell more ice cream per capita than anywhere else in the world, I'm not, not, just Matt, not just New England, but in Michigan and all across the North Country, 14% butterfat is pretty much is the lowest pretty much that they'll use up there. A lot of, some people go to 18%. I myself find that 18% leaves too much of a, 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 a fat note in the back of your throat. So 14% is, is a standard in the industry, but as Steve says, in the warmer weather, uh, 10%. Did you drain this? Yes. Are you sure? No. Good to check, huh? Should I drain it into the sieve? Maybe this will work. Okay. Let's double check. Yeah, she's drained. Is this closed? It's closed. Okay. Ready for takeoff. <clears throat> I'm just going to pour the mix in first and then, uh, then turn the barrel on. So this is uh, five quarts of 10% dairy mix. And you can get this anywhere in the country. A any major city has uh, a dairy blend like this. And we call it mix. Terrible term uh, because it sounds like a powder. You got to turn on the beater first. This is Steve's machine. I don't do equipment. I do flavors. <laughs> All right, so now we're freezing. Now you can add your flavor. No, you can start. Uh, you got to move quickly now. You got your refrigeration going. Right. So we're making a, a salted caramel, and what I'm using as the flavor base to this is a butter pecan base. Let me put this in here, and, and I'll talk to you about the flavor. Do you need any vanilla? I don't need any vanilla. Okay. This is a water-cooled machine. You have an engine that we call the compressor, and you have to cool the compressor. In your home refrigerator, you have a little teeny tiny 1 8 horsepower compressor, and it sucks in air from the front of your refrigerator and blows it out the back. You never notice it. We build these either air-cooled, like you see in the uh, CB350 and CB200, or in the bigger ones, we build them water-cooled or air-cooled. So right now, when the compressor went on, uh, and it started to warm up, it called for water. So we have a garden hose connected to it. It's circulating around the compressor, coming back and going over to the sink here. And then that water's thrown away. It sounds inefficient, but it's not. It's better if you can do it than uh, running it as an air-cooled and putting a lot of hot air into this room. 
because here in Florida, we don't want hot air in the room. We'd have to run our air conditioning, which is fossil fuel, and we'd have to run it longer and harder to remove the heat. Anything else going in there? Uh, not, no, there isn't. Okay. Uh, so what I use as a flavor base is uh, a butter pecan base. Uh, and I rice is infamous for water ice flavors. Uh, water ice flavors are juice concentrates, flavor, sugar, water. Uh, since I joined the company, we've developed a line of ice cream ingredients. Uh, when I was with Oranger, we were probably had the most diversified uh, flavor ingredient line for ice cream in the United States. So my goal was to develop a line of ice cream ingredients uh, or a, a cut above what's going on in the industry today. Uh, one of the first products I came out with was this butter pecan base. So the name butter pecan on here is sort of a misnomer. This can be used in a multifunctional uh, aspect. The ingredients in this are brown sugar, water, sugar, molasses, non-fat milk, butter, natural flavors, and some stabilization. Okay, so even though it says butter pecan, what, what we're dealing with is a background flavor. So we put this flavor in, you can, now you can add uh, pecans to it, salted pecans, you can add almonds, have a butter almond ice cream, you can, you can actually have it as a butterscotch flavor. Okay, I'm using it as a background flavor for the hottest flavor in the industry today, which is salty caramel. The, I, I put it in a reduced level, uh, I put in 12, 12 fluid ounces to the, to the five quarts. Mm -hmm. So what I'm looking for is a mild background flavor, and then we're gonna add some salty caramel variegate to this, and the, the variegate uh, is a new product for iRice. Okay. It's a, a, a highly, highly cooked uh, caramel. You'll see the color's very dark. You get some very strong milk and dairy notes out of it, and we've added uh, sea salt to it. So the flavor really jumps at you, and, and today, in the ice cream industry, um, the sweet and salt is, is what's infamous out there right now. So salty caramel is a flavor that started on the west coast and most flavor trends do start on the west coast. Um, C's candies developed a salty caramel about, I don't know, 12 years ago or so. and It was just a caramel coated in chocolate with sea salt on the top. Now, this trend, uh, every, all the confectioners are now making salty caramel, but this trend uh, articulated into uh, the bakery side and now into ice cream. So salted caramel is one of the preeminent flavors out there today. There are a number of different recipes. Um, my recipe is just a, a background flavor, whether it's this butter pecan or it's a, it, this is basically a butter molasses and dairy product. Uh, or you can use a caramel as a background flavor you can add salt into the mix if you want to. I'm just keeping this very simple. So, how long? Steve, 10 minutes on this? Uh, eight to 10 minutes, yeah. Uh, Rod, we got a note from the, uh, the fourth balcony tier from one of the seating hostesses, and she said they're having a little trouble hearing you in the back. If you could just speak up a little more. Hey, way out there. I, I have a very soft voice, even with this microphone. Yes. Yeah, we're going to get you a megaphone. I need a megaphone. <laughs> I have a very soft voice. I can hear myself, but I apologize for anyone that can't. If, if you can't hear me, just say, Rod, speak up. Um, Rod, speak up. Rod, speak up. <laughs> Again. Okay, when we pull this off, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll variegate the ice cream also, and I'm going to show you some tricks uh, to easy handling into variegating. Uh, and we're also going to fold in some chocolate chips. Well, you're going to be busy. We're going to be busy. I want to show the people a little something about uh, refrigeration. Would you mind coming up for a second? We'll put you on camera. Uh, I want to, I'm going to go over here to the sink. And uh, Ken, if you can swing the camera around, we're going to go over here, Rod. Um, this, come on over here for a second. This is the water going in. So feel that. That's cold, right? If you can turn around for the camera. That's cold. Okay, now down there is where the water is coming out of the machine. And how does that feel? That's warm. That's warm. Okay. That tells you that it's taking the heat out of the machine. Uh, so it's an easy way to test how your machine is running. If that was coming out super cold, it'd be using too much water. But more likely, if it came out real hot. That's not quite hot enough to take a shower in. But if it came out real hot, 
uh, then something is constricted. One of the hoses has got a bend in it and uh, it's eventually going to shut the machine off. So an easy way to tell that uh, your machine is running properly is check the warm water coming out. You're a pro. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Um, my very expensive timer. Yeah, let's give them a round. All right, thank you. Uh, my very expensive timer that my, uh, the money honey, my bookkeeper gave me, uh, I just set that for a general idea. I get talking and forget that I'm making ice cream. That is a criminal offense. When you're making ice cream, you're not talking on the phone to a friend. You are not uh, taking care of people out front. Uh, my friend Gary of Gary's Ice Cream up in Chelmsford, Mass, has a sign on his door that says, we, all, we love you very much, go away, I'm making ice cream. And that's the attitude you have to take. This is your job for the next few hours, just like Sadie's is security. She's making sure that the ice cream's coming along fine. Right, girl? Um, oh, so Steve, Steve, I remember you saying that uh, you like to add particulates into your machine. Yeah. So if I add these chips in now, be beautiful. Be perfect. Go for so it. So instead of folding these in, which was the way I learned before Steve's equipment was modified to the point that you can add particulate into the machine, I would hand fold it in. But I'm going to go with Steve's idea because go it's it. going to be easier when I variegate afterwards. If he drops any, you can't have it this time. No, I'm sorry. It's chocolate. Dogs can't eat chocolate. And we just want to make sure we get all the chips into the barrel. All of them, even that one that Sadie wants to have. <laughs> Those are semi-sweet. But you can use whatever you like. Chocolate is uh, very, and we have to, when someone asks a question, we have to repeat it. She asked, were they dark or semi-sweet? Uh, they're semi-sweet, and you can use anything you want. Chocolate is extremely subjective. Um, my wife, Paula, who you met, uh, likes 85% uh, cocoa chocolate. I, I think it tastes like chalk. Uh, my idea of the dream chocolate is M&M's. So chocolate is a horse race, whatever, whatever it is you prefer. Question back there. The question is, what is the speed of the machine right now? I'm running at 170 RPMs, so I'm going to produce a super premium ice cream uh, of about a medium air content. Uh, if I took the speed up, I would get uh, uh, more ice cream with more air in it. Air is not a bad thing. And keep in mind, nobody ever walked out of an ice cream parlor and said, you know what, that's the best damn air content I ever ate. People don't do that. They say that salted caramel was really great flavor. I loved it. So people eat flavor. But you can adjust with this machine and only this, these machines the air content that you want. To explain it very simply, imagine you had a bowl and you pour some cream in it and you have a whisk and you stir it with a whisk, it's going to remain cream. If you take an electric mixer and put it in there, boom, you've got whipped cream. The faster, more revolution per minute that you spin it, the more ice cream, uh, the more air you're going to get. Uh, and air is not a bad thing. It depends on the product you're using. If you're using a 10% like this, we like to cut down on the air. If you're using a 16%, we probably want a little more air. So let's just see how this looks. I'm going to open the gate and close it. I'm looking for it to cut off sharp like a knife went through it. And it's not there. It's still oozing out. I only put the timer on, I didn't set it for any specific time, I just put it on to remind me that I'm making ice cream today. Um, I don't put a timer on the machine. I don't put gadgets on the machine because gadgets break and usually when you put them on they, they are tied into the controls and it takes down your whole, whole machine. If this gadget was to break, well not this one, my bookkeeper gave it to me, but if this was just a cheap timer and it broke, I'd throw it away and I'd go buy a new one. Uh, for six bucks and I put it right there and when the bell goes off I'm over here I'm not just standing here staring at it. That's what we do when it's new I'm over here getting the flavor ready for the next batch. I'm getting the dairy ingredients uh, Poured out and then when the bell goes off. Oh, yeah, I got a couple of minutes to get back to the machine On average a batch takes about eight minutes to freeze your first batch will take a little bit longer than your 15th batch so if, if you were making 15 batches of vanilla first batch would be nine minutes, second batch would be eight minutes, the 14th batch would also be eight minutes because the barrel is cold. The more sugar we put into the product, sugar retards freezing. It takes longer to freeze a high sugar product, so Italian ice takes uh, longer than ice cream. 
So if Rod put a whole bunch of sugar in here in the form of the caramel, car caramel base, it would take a little longer to freeze than, say, a vanilla. Strawberry will take a little bit longer than vanilla. You just heard the machine, I don't know if you could hear it, the machine just got a little bit quieter. It was making a slapping noise against the wall. That's gone, and that product is starting to firm up. Now that's starting to cut off. We'll let it go probably another minute. Another minute. Yeah, and then it, it will be ready. The question is, can you do this same test for uh, gelato? Again, gelato is ice cream. The only difference between gelato and ice cream is we're making salted caramel, mint chip, Oreo cookie. The Italians are making tiramisu, hazelnut, fruit of Bosco. It's the only difference. They'd love to tell you there's a world of difference. There isn't. Uh, Italian ice, uh, not quite as much, but yes, you don't want a, a runny product. You want it to uh, be firm enough that when you put it into a bucket, it's not ready to put on a cone and hand to someone. But the, but the uh, vast majority of the uh, moisture in the product is taken out and then you put it into your uh, serving freezer or your storage freezer depending on when you're going to use it. So are you ready? Have you got your spatula? I am ready, Steve right. Thompson. You don't have to deal with the chips, so you don't have to be three-handed today. Thankfully, because this is a beautiful machine that will accept particulate into the barrel. Well, I taught you well. Yes. And it wasn't modified. It's been doing this since way before you were born, even though I know you were down around Ben Franklin. <clears throat> Just goes to show how long, how much I listen. <laughs> All right, turn off the refrigeration. We don't want any more chilling. Just push down on the blue button. There. And you're ready to take it out. Okay, to variegate, what I do is I'll pull off about a third of a bucket. Then I'll take some variegate and I'll coat the top. The next step, and this is, this is the trick to variegating, is I want to push the spatula down into the barrel and come straight across down and straight across. So I'm making a grid. Any more than this and you'll just get caramel ice cream. Okay, So three or four swipes going across each way so you're making a, a grid. Then I'll pull off another layer of ice cream. I'll add some more variegate and do the same thing. Remember, you don't want to push this all the way down. You want to push it about a quarter of the way into the, into the bucket. So three or four stripes going each way. And then on the top, the same thing. Straight down, straight down and across, straight down and across, turn the barrel, straight down and across. And then to make it look pretty, we just add a little bit to the top. And this is ready to go. Beautiful. We're going to have everybody come up and try it. I wanted to tell you one thing. When you are working with a variant like this uh, and you're new to it, you might use a little too much. You know, too much is not a problem running out is a problem. Now, if this comes in uh, a can, we call it a number 10 tin. It's a standard of the industry. If this comes in a can and we run out of variegate three quarters of the way through because we used a little too much, if we take our spatula and dip it into the can, we're now contaminating the can. We have to use it all today. So what you do for safety's sake is Rod measured out how much he wanted to use. I would also keep the can on the side open so that if I get to the point where I'm three quarters of the way there and I've just run out of the, uh, the, the butterscotch swirl or strawberry swirl, whatever I'm working with, I can go to my can, re-pour it in, and work from there. You don't want to take a dairy product and dip it into <coughs> a can of product that you would be putting back in the refrigerator. You've contaminated and bacteria will grow. So either you use it all up or you um, do my method of just setting it aside and have it. So what I'm doing here at the end is I'm just putting the, the edge of the spatula up against the blade just to draw out the final amount of product. It makes a little dam. 
uh, the bulkier product comes out, if we were making vanilla, or when you see us make Italian ice, it's all going to come out in about 35 seconds. Um, when you're making ice cream, I've seen uh, new people make ice cream where they'll spend five minutes getting that last uh, three or four ounces out of the machine. It's a waste of your time. If you're making ice cream, you're probably going to do a second batch of this or a third batch, or you're going to go into a related product uh, instead of rinsing out the machine. You don't make chocolate and then rinse out the machine to make vanilla. You make vanilla, then you make chocolate next. Or you make vanilla and then strawberry, then Bordeaux cherry, then black raspberry. So any tiny bit that's left in the machine of strawberry is going to be covered over by the black raspberry. Uh, and it'll blend very nicely. The only exception to that is uh, rum raisin ice cream. Uh, as you know, I'm from the South Bronx. Uh, if you, uh, you have to rinse the machine and then have the bishop come in and bless it before you make anything after rum raisin because a New Yorker knows if you get so much as one raisin in the maple walnut, we know it's a bug. You know, and we don't want bugs in our ice cream. We don't want people being scared off that they, something just went squish that shouldn't go squish. So that worked out fine. Let's so give far. everybody a taste of that. And uh, then we're going to go on to the Italian ice. Can we make some room over here? Just slide some of this back. So come on up. And we'll give you a taste of this and see what you think. Rod is from the Irish Mafia side of Boston, so if you don't like it, it Don't. won't hurt his feelings. You'll just never get out of here alive. There you go. You know, it's funny, Rod, when we uh, start the day making ice cream, everybody's all excited. They say, oh, I'm getting free ice cream. Somewhere around 1.30, if I go, hey, you want to make another batch of ice cream? It's, oh, no, 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 no more. Because <laughs> we do fill them up. Yeah, there you go. I think I'll leave the spoons for you. You can all can grab your own spoon here. That might work a little faster. Thank you. And I will start rinsing this out so that we can make the Italian ice. No, the, we're going to do that in the afternoon. The Italian ice is next, okay. and then Rod will be free. Okay. Yeah, Rod has to go back to the cold this afternoon. Yeah. Now to rinse out the machine, I'm just pouring in some uh, water. Let that slosh around. And again, since now there's just water in there and not dairy product, I have to turn off the beater or dasher before I uh, drain it out, otherwise it's going to go all over everybody. That's good. Excuse me? It's a Gallagher style. You can have <laughs> Yes, right. I know you're all here to see tie-dye Jeff. Uh, he's back in the wings stretching his vocal cords and as soon as we make some Italian ice he'll be on stage. We're the opening act for tie-dye. Jeff, did you want to try some of this? I, I realize it's not as pure as you used to. Oh, you did? Okay. Here's a little trick. Let me get out here. Uh, there might be uh, two or three chocolate chips left in the machine and if I pour this uh, rinse water down the drain uh, doing that over the course of weeks, it's going to clog up the drain. So go steal a spaghetti st uh, strainer from your spouse, put this in the sink, and pour all your drain water right through it. That way you're not clogging up your drains. And sure enough, 
I got a few chips. Question. If you take this ice cream and put it in your dipping cabinet right away, you could start serving it in a couple of hours. Most people make ice cream today that they want to serve tomorrow. One main reason is, um, and I always win every contest that I ever go up against any other companies, I always win because I know a little secret. That secret is the flavor enhances over 24 hours. So if you taste something right now and say, you know, that's good, but it, it doesn't have enough flavor. Well, the flavor is going to pop 24 hours from now. So when I'm in a contest, I was just recently in one, and uh, my flavor won because I add a lot more flavor if it's going to be served to the public right away. Uh, Jeff taught me, I was using uh, an ounce of vanilla to a gallon of mix, and Jeff uh, showed me his ice cream where he uses a quart of, uh, an ounce of vanilla to a quart of ice cream. And now everybody raves about my ice cream. They say it's the best they've ever had. Because you eat flavor. You don't eat air content. You don't eat fat content. You eat the flavor. Uh, I, I love coffee. And uh, my coffee ice cream will grow hair on your spleen. And I make it that way because if you're a tea drinker, you're not going to order coffee ice cream. It's as plain and simple as that. Uh, but if you're a coffee drinker, you really want something that stands out. So I make a very intense coffee. I actually use uh, a cheap coffee, but it works best in ice cream. Taster's choice. And I made some, I gave my sister uh, some uh, of my Taster's Choice co strong coffee ice cream with a warning. I said, do not eat this after 6 o'clock at night. Well, I saw her two days later and she's all hollow-eyed and stressed out. It looked like she was coming down off of something. And I said, what happened to you? She said, well, I ate a quart of your coffee ice cream at 11 o'clock. I've been up for three days now. <laughs> so now I make it with decaf. Okay, we're ready to go over here. Here I come. All right. Oh. Thankfully, we have an Long expert pouring this off. Never stand in front of the camera. No one wants to see your back. <clears throat> Jeff, you see how my idea would work if we put a microphone on Sadie and gave everybody a dog biscuit. Anytime there's a question, they would just hold out their dog biscuit. Sadie'd come running to them, and we'd pick them up on the microphone. That's a great idea. I think I'm going to patent it. The dog mic. That's why you make the big bucks. <laughs> okay, Rod, how much water do you want? You're making a half batch here. Half of a 24 quart batch. Right. I want. Okay. We heard there was hot or salted caramel in here. It was delicious. Was it, is it all gone? Is that really here, go. Oh, thank this, you. This is Vonda and her evil twin sister, Connie. Hi. And uh, they work in the office. What's the total volume we can put in here? Total volume we can put in here. Ten quarts. <laughs> nine quarts. Okay. Two, two gallons, one quart of water. And a half a gallon of water ice base. Okay. Two. I need uh, two pounds of sugar into the water. All right. Let me through the water first. <laughs> We're measuring out the water and the sugar and the base right now. And just tap water. Just right out of the tap. Um, an interesting question that comes up is people say, uh, should I filter the water? We have a real fancy digital scale here from Malcolm Stogo Associates, and so we'll put it to use and measure the sugar. Uh, let me find a container. Well, we'll use one of these. Uh, so the question is, should you... Uh, filter the water? It's, it's a very good question. The answer is yes and no. Uh, right now, um, here in Tampa, uh, I'm just going to zero this out.
Okay, now you can put your sugar in there to measure it. Um, here in Tampa, the water is some of the worst in the world. Um, it has a very high mineral content. It's going through all the sand. It's, it's like liquid rock. Um, if, if I was in Tampa and uh, there's not a lot of tourists here, most of them are over in Clearwater, St. Pete, uh, down to Sarasota, Naples, Fort Myers, but we're not the heavy, heavy tourist area. So the people that are eating my Italian ice grew up here. They've been drinking this water all their lives. They know what it tastes like. They don't know it's bad. Uh, so if I'm selling to a local market, there's no reason to purify the water in any way because it's what they're used to drinking. Now, I go down to Miami and everybody from Miami, Miami is from New York. So you can't get away with this water in Miami. It's got to taste like New York. And in New York, we have the best filtration system in the world. It starts up in the Catskill Mountains, and it's a couple of large screens uh, before the, the pipe that connects it to take it down to the city. And the large screen takes out the dead bodies and the, uh, the tire, truck tires. And from there, you know, that flavored water works its way down to Manhattan, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, we need water like that uh, in Miami, so the best way to do it is to take the uh, Florida horrible uh, tap water and run it through a Culligan uh, water system uh, or any other system that you want. Uh, Home Depot sells them, General Electric makes them. Something to just take a lot of the minerals out of the water. So when the question comes up, do I need to filter the water, tell me who you're selling to. And if it's all tourists, yes. If it's the locals, no. What's next? We're going to add some sugar right to the water, Steve. Okay. And sugar dissolves very quickly in cold water. Uh, you're not using any special sugar. It's not bartender's sugar. Uh, it's not powdered sugar. It's just plain old sugar. And there's no difference in sugar uh, by price. Sugar is sugar. So whether you buy Domino sugar or the local supermarket, this is called Great Value. That came from a, a local supermarket. There's no difference between this uh, domino sugar, hello, uh, the domino sugar and uh, this plain sugar. So you buy the lowest priced sugar that you can find. Uh, often sugar is used as what they call a loss leader. It's, uh, a loss leader is something the supermarket's doing to get you into the store. Uh, they want you to buy you know, the fruits and the frozen foods, the money's in the frozen foods. And so they put sugar on sale. You know, a five pound bag for $1.50. Well, they expect you to come in, buy a five pound bag, and then all your other groceries. I walk in and I buy 200 five pound bags, getting the best price I can. They hate to see me come in. Oh, here goes this Italian ice guy again. Uh, but just plain old sugar, the cheapest you can get it. Sometimes it's the supermarket, sometimes it's a wholesaler selling a hundred pound bag. Uh, uh, a customer of mine just called the other day, the uh, Cannoli King of Italian ices in upstate New York, and he just got a fantastic deal on sugar, buying whole pallets of it. Just an amazing price, because nobody's buying sugar at this time of year. And he knows it doesn't go bad, so he's stocking up for the summertime. So your main ingredients, your two main ingredients are water and sugar. Couldn't get any cheaper. Safety precaution, in case I forget to close the barrel door. Okay. We'll add the water with the sugar. And once we get this going, I'm going to tell you about the three levels of Italian ice, because you'll <coughs> use all three. OK, we're going to make a strawberry lemonade Italian ice. Water ice, sorbet, Danish ice, Greek ice. They're all the same. They're all non-dairy frozen desserts. So if someone says, I've, I've seen this actually happen in, in, uh, in an ice cream store in New York. <clears throat> a fellow was making uh, red raspberry sorbet. And he had red raspberry water ice. The water ice was selling at $2 a cup. The sorbet was selling at four fifty dollars a cup. It's the exact same product. But the name sorbet des designates a higher quality product. They're all the same. They're all non-dairy frozen desserts. So whether it's Italian ice, uh, slush in New England, it's called slush, uh, Danish ice, sorbet, all the same product. Okay. And, and here's actually what it looks like. Um, 
This is Italian ice. This is a uh, three and a half ounce squeeze cup. The preferred way to eat it. And by the way, if you ask someone, a paper supplier for squeeze cups, they'll look at you like a deer in the headlights unless they're from New York. It's a pleated water cup. It's got little pleats in it like a lady's dress or you get it at a water uh, fountain. And we put it in here, you'll see us do it, and then we eat it from the bottom up. And uh, that's how we do it. So that's Italian ice. Here's frozen lemonade. This is what we sell at Universal Studios, Disney, SeaWorld. Up in New England, they call the same product slush. It's the same as this, except we put it into a tall 16 ounce cup and we pull it out of the machine a little softer. And then what Rod's talking about, here's Le Penetier restaurant selling strawberry sorbet for $4.50. And the only difference is they're putting it in this nice uh, glass. That's the only difference in the product. People say, oh, well, I thought sorbet had dairy. No, not unless you want to put it in. Um, so please go ahead, continue. Sure. So um, this is strawberry lemonade water ice base. Uh, there's strawberry juice concentrate in here, lemon juice concentrate, and some natural and artificial flavors. So we're going to put in about a half a gallon. Now, not unlike Steve, I'm, I'm not good about following rules, so here we go. I'm just not going to measure it. Ken, can we get a picture of Sadie here? This is one of her favorite products. And so she wants to make sure she's first in line, always. Keeping a close eye on the product. All righty. Now we're going to add some stabilizer to this. This product is called Stabilize. It's a product made by I Rice Company. It's a liquid, concentrated liquid stabilization system. The ingredients: corn syrup, glycerin, locust bean gum, guar gum, cellulose gum, citric acid, and some preservatives. Okay, I believe that you should add. Uh, a stabilization system to ice, especially if you're going to store it in a cabinet. I know, Jeff doesn't like that. That's okay. But he's and off Steve, <laughs> Steve's a purist also, so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna make ice and you're gonna serve it right away, you don't need the stabilization. But if you're gonna put it in an ice cream cabinet, or you're gonna put it in a cart out in front of the store, you're gonna get water separation. If you add the stabilization, you won't get the separation over a period of time. Okay. One of my favorite uh, areas for people to sell product besides a push cart is, is a great business to get going. But if you can get uh, involved with, uh, say, the Little League uh, or any of the other organizations in town, and there you tend to get a rush of people, two or three hundred people at a time. So you have to have a fair amount of product backed up. People like uh, Universal Studios uh, are making product all week long uh, to serve the, the people who come to the park, but they know that they get a bigger rush on certain days. And so they have to store the product for a longer period of time. By stabilizing the product, you're you, you are able to keep it longer. I like to make product uh, on demand as fresh as I need, but then again, I'm just standing around waiting for people to come to the door and the weather to be good so I can afford to do that. As your business grows, you're not gonna always have that luxury. You're gonna need a warehouse or a, a walk-in freezer filled with product that you made two or three weeks ago. Are you ready to start it up? Yes, we are. Okay, so we're gonna start up the Infant Overrun. We were running at uh, 170 RPMs. We're gonna take it up to full speed because air is really not a factor in sugar water. Water is gonna expand 17%. If you take this liquid and oops, put it into ice cube trays, it will expand uh, by 17%, no more. So we run at full speed, uh, the faster you spin it, uh, the faster it freezes, and this product with the high sugar content takes a little longer. Now there's three levels of Italian ice, and I use all three, and I think you'll use all three in your business. Uh, there is using uh, fresh fruit. Oh, I've got fresh fruit. Hold on a second, I'll be right back. You have fresh fruit, Steve? I do, be right back. Jeff, do we have citric acid in here? What? Citric acid, do we have citric acid here? I'll ask the expert when he comes back. I like to use some fresh fruit in the product. Sadie, get down. Sadie. Steve, do you have any citric acid? Hmm? Citric acid solution? I don't have any. No. Bad girl. That's it. You're thrown out. Okay, so, so the formula that I used here. Speak up. 
The question is, what's the ratio of, of stable ease? So I'll give you the whole recipe that I use right here. This is uh, two gallons and two quarts of water. A half a gallon of water ice base. Two pounds of sugar. Eight fluid ounces of stable ease. Can you do that again? Sorry, can you do it again? Yes. Two gallons and one quart of water. A half a gallon of water ice base. Two pounds of sugar mixed into the water, pre-mixed into the water. Eight fluid ounces of stable ease. Now normally I would add citric acid to any fruited ice because it, it draws out the flavor more, gives you that nice tartness. We don't have any. We'll survive today. How much? How much would you normally add? How much would you normally add on the citric acid? For a tart a uh, fruit like a strawberry or a lemon or an orange to this size batch about two fluid ounces of citric acid, of citric acid solution. Question? How many RPMs was the question? Full speed, 234. Um, I want to talk to you about the three levels of Italian ice while this is running. Uh, you will use all three. There is no question about it in your business. It's inevitable. Uh, this is where Jeff and I draw the line because Jeff says, oh, I'm only going to use fresh fruit. It's not always practical. Um, fresh fruit is a great way to make an Italian ice, sugar, water, and flavor, and uh, you're going to use the product within three days. Uh, this method, the strawberry, if any of you have bought strawberries uh, in the supermarket, it's really hard to find good strawberries. They vary all over the place. This time of year, they're coming up from Ar Argentina and they have no flavor whatsoever. You cannot afford to have inconsistency in your product. When you go to a McDonald's and buy a hamburger, I think it's a lousy hamburger, but it's the same lousy hamburger in Tampa as it is in San Diego, as it is in Moscow, as it is in Bangkok. Wherever you go, the McDonald's hamburger is the same. And if you come up to Cape Cod once a year and you want to have a strawberry ice, you want it just the way you remember it. So you need consistency. So I get consistency by using the iRice bases uh, because they're controlling that. And then I add to the product with some fresh fruit. Now I have fresh frozen strawberries. They're, they were picked and frozen immediately and I like them because they too are consistent. So again, right into the machine. Because we can do that with an Emory Thompson machine. How am I doing, Steve? You're doing fine. Thank you. And that's going to give it a lot of extra additional flavor, plus the, uh, the taste of the fruit. Now, while I'm adding that, uh, and also flavors like, uh, can you grab a mango? Um, mango ice, it's very hard to find mangoes in the supermarket. And it's even harder to figure out if they're ripe. Mango has become a, a really popular flavor. When I first brought mango home to my kids, uh, and put in the freezer, I swear they would have eaten the, grown, the green beans frozen before they would try mango. Now, when you say it's one of the most popular flavors? Uh, mango sells 10 to 1 uh, over any other flavor and, from my rice and... And, and this uh, is the easiest way to do mango and it's, it's a fantastic product. Now, that's fresh, that's using the eye rice, and then you get down to the big question of, and someone says, well, I'm not going any lower than that. I go, oh yeah, what about kids? What about bubblegum? We don't have any bubblegum trees growing anywhere here in Florida or anywhere else in the world that I'm aware of. So you can buy, that's an iRice bubblegum flavor. And this sugar and water is going to give you bubblegum. Maybe you're a purist and you're never going to eat bubblegum Italian ice. But are you going to turn away a whole family, four children and two adults because you don't have, because you don't want to give them bubblegum? I, I don't think that makes good business sense. You have to pick the business you're in and stick to it. We're in the frozen dessert business. We don't sell cigarettes. We don't sell uh, Honda cars. We sell frozen desserts. But if we limited ourselves like a gelateria and only sell tiramisu and tell the mint chip people to go away or the Italian nice bubblegum people to go away, we're not going to have enough customers to stay in business. So using an extract is often the only way you're going to get the flavor until they start growing bubblegum trees. So you have to look at the concept of you're in business, and you have to have something for everyone, if that's the way your market is set up. You're gonna get a kick out of hearing about Jeff's business because it's extremely unique 
in the industry. He's only open from 6 until 10 at night, and he doesn't want children in the store. And it doesn't mean he's an old ogre and doesn't want children. Well, he may be, but uh, he's not turning away children. It's just he's making adult flavors for adults. And that's his target market, and that's perfect. He's not trying to sell cotton candy at one in the afternoon to the kids that walk by. It's not his market. He's selling to uh, a group of people because he's right on the edge of the largest retirement community in the United States of America. So he knows his market. And that's a, that's, wouldn't you agree that's a key to the business, is knowing who your market is? You have to know your demographics. You have to be aware who your competition is in the market, uh, what the traffic flow is, you have to know what's going on in that specific market, no question. And, and I don't agree with everybody about everything. That's what makes it a horse race. Up where Rod is from in Boston, the typical ice cream parlor sells hot dogs and hamburgers. Oh my gosh, what are you, crazy? You're mixing greasy food with ice cream? But they've been doing it that way since uh, the Revolutionary War. That's what they expect. Right about the time I was born. Exactly. That's what they expect out of an ice cream parlor, that we can go there and also get a hot dog. You would never, in my world, you would never do that. But in the New England market, that's the way they do it. So you have to look at your market and say, what will sell right here? If I tried to sell Brooksville, where my factory is, uh, sell Brooksville, here we go. If I tried to sell $7 sorbet in the town where I live, I would sell maybe one to my wife Paula, and that would be about it. The market won't bear spending seven dollars for a sorbet, but they'll sure spend a dollar fifty for the same product that's right here. So let me give you an idea of the cost of, of the, this batch of, of water ice, Italian ice, Swedish ice, Danish ice sorbet. Okay, I'm going to give it to you without the strawberries because I didn't realize Steve was putting that in there. I stole them. So Paula, they're free. Paula distracted they're free. If you can pick your own strawberries, there's no cost. So I assigned a cost to water, because there is a cost to it, whether it's you're buying your own spring water or you're using tap water, there is a cost to that. So I just use a, a cost of 20 cents a gallon. So for the two gallons and a quart, we have 45 cents. For the half gallon of water ice base, it's about $9. Two pounds of sugar, I have it at 55 cents. That's a rough estimate. So you have a dollar ten. The eight fluid ounces stabilize is about seven and a half cents a pound. So that's sixty-one cents for eight fluid ounces. And the citric acid, which we didn't add, is about twenty cents. So you got a cost for this entire batch of three eleven dollars and thirty-four cents, which breaks down to about three dollars and seventy-five cents a gallon. It's very inexpensive to produce. Yes, in the back. Labor. Way back there. Labor. Uh, are you doing it yourself? Are you actually paying somebody to do it? Where is the labor built into that? The question, Labor's, the question is, uh, I've just the assigned raw from? material costs to this. So oh. your labor costs have to be included. Absolutely. Labor costs, the cost of your cup, spoon, napkin, uh, the cleaning, although you have Sadie, so you don't need cleaning. That's right. Yeah. All that you have to add into the cost, yes. But if you buy it wholesale from a customer, up, a wholesaler up in New Jersey, say Little Jimmy's, you're looking at $26, $28 for a lesser quality product using my machines it's made on. But uh, it's made up in, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And then you have to ship sugar water. This stuff is heavy. And you have to freeze it. You have to ship it down here. So you're looking at $100 in shipping. They have a minimum order because it doesn't pay them to ship one container. And then the minimum order is so big, you have to have a walk-in freezer. So your costs are through the roof. They're going to be somewhere around $35 per three-gallon tub as opposed to our $3.80 uh, for a tub. They're just as no comparison uh, whatsoever. Everybody has a right to make a profit. Anytime you buy anything, that's why for 109 years we only sell direct because middlemen don't know enough about our machines and why add 33% cost putting it through a middleman? Again, they have a right to make money, otherwise they wouldn't be in business. But when you buy from a wholesale business, uh, they have a right to make money. So let's say they mark it up 33. They actually mark it up more like 400% from $3 up to 
$28. But your biggest cost in Italian ice, buying it from someone, is the shipping cost. This stuff is sugar and water, and as soon as you leave it out on the floor, it's starting to melt. So even if you're going to buy it from 20 miles away, are you going to get a refrigerated truck? It, it doesn't make sense. You can pay for a machine in less than one season by making your own product. Plus, when you buy from a wholesaler, it's, no, I'm sorry, we're out of bubble gum today, but we'll send you more strawberry. But I already have 30 tubs of strawberry. Well, I'm sorry, that's all we got is strawberry. Uh, so you're at the mercy of the person that's selling it to you. Now, uh, that said, if I was in a town and I wanted to start up an Italian ice business and there were other people who said, this is a great idea, gee, I'd go into the wholesale Italian ice business immediately. And I'd say, okay, you're in uh, Rye, New York, and uh, you're, over, you're down in Pelham or Larchmont, yeah, I'll sell you Italian ice because they're the next town over. My, my customers are not going to drive 10 miles to get an Italian ice. So now I'm controlling the market because I'm making the wholesale ice. I'm selling it in a controllable neighborhood, uh, uh, radius-wise. And so I've got a retail business and a wholesale business selling sugar water. It's, it's that simple. Uh, because your ingredients are so low compared to ice cream or any other, uh, any other food product you can think of. Now one of the great things about making your own product is you're, you're only limited by your own imagination. You can create whatever flavor profile you want. So it, 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 whatever, whatever you can come up with, you're not limited by whatever the dairy <coughs> wants to sell you. Well, you, you just opened up a Pandora's box. Me, Did I? I'll be right back. Uh-oh. Not a Sharknado. Yes, a Sharknado. <laughs> now, you're the one who brought it up, not There me. may I, be a I, limit to what I you can do. I have not planned to bring the shark out. But looking at trends, there was a B-movie that was out this summer called Sharknado, in which a tornado formed off of Los Angeles, which is impossible, and all the sharks got sucked up and they got brought inland. The sharks were dropping in people's swimming pools. They were dropping on the highways. It was just a mess. And so I saw it as a marketing opportunity and I said, let's make a new product. We'll call it Shark Teeth Italian Ice. So we made uh, Rod's Cherry Italian Ice, added candy corn, you know, little pointed things, little candy corn for the teeth. And we call it Shark's Tooth Italian Ice. So that formula's out there. I know it's gonna be, you know, it's, it's award seeking. Uh, it's going to be fantastic, and so this summer, when you see Sharknado or Shark Tooth Italian Ice, you'll know that it started right here with my friend. Paul, do you want to take the shark back to our pool? <laughs> so, you can have fun with Italian Ice, and as Rod is saying, you can instantly uh, make changes. You can just say, oh, here's a good idea for a flavor. Exactly. Sugar and water. So, if you start out with the flavor profile, they that is recommended by the industry or, or the flavor manufacturer, you have the right to change it to make it any way you want. That's, again, that's the pleasure of making your own product, whether it's ice cream, gelato, sorbet, whatever. Oh, one interesting thing, Rod, is the differences up and down the East Coast of Italian ices. Uh, in New York, uh, if I was using a bigger machine than this, my formula would call for seven pounds of sugar. If I go down to Philadelphia, the same formula becomes eight pounds of sugar. Why? Because in Philadelphia, they like their Italian ice sweeter. So the more sugar, oh, and they, I'm sorry, they like it smoother. I didn't mean sweeter, I meant smoother. One pound is not gonna really make it sweeter, but one pound will make it a smoother ice. So in New York City, Manhattan, it's seven pounds of sugar. In Philadelphia, it's eight pounds of sugar. Uh, in Brooklyn on Bay 8th Street, it's, uh, which is all uh, Italian neighborhood, it's six pounds of sugar because they like their product, what we call an Italian product, we call it granita or granite. Granita is just Italian ice, but it's only six pounds of sugar, so it's coarse and crunchy. Correct. You can never sell in Philadelphia. So when people say, oh, I want a coarse ice like I remember growing up in Brooklyn, and we check them for guns, uh, or I want it nice and smooth like in Philadelphia, uh, we can give them the product they want just by altering the sugar content. That's all it is. It's real simple. And these people will tell you, oh, it's secret, you can't do it. I used to tell people, my recipes came from my great-grandfather who came over from Genoa, Italy on a boat. 
Well, I've never been to uh, Genoa, Italy. I'm not Italian. I don't have a great grandfather. Uh, it's strictly uh, mathematics and physics. More sugar, smoother product. Less sugar, uh, coarser product. You had a question. Uh, redesign. How do they fall through all cargo? How do they what? How do they fall through all cargo ice? Uh, I mean, that's where everybody. The question is about Rita's Ice. My family put Rita's Ice into business about 40 years ago when it was the family. Now it's a, a corporate entity. Um, back then, I thought the ice was uh, better than uh, what it is today. However, uh, it has gotten the word out there uh, as far as what ice is. The original Rita's would keep ice for only 24 hours and then uh, they would scrap it all and, and make fresh. That's when the family was running. Today, uh, it's not so much. Uh, so I think it's uh, more along the lines of a commercial ice. Uh, I don't love it. Uh, it's made me a lot of money selling machinery, uh, but it's not my favorite ice. And I'm sure before the end of the day, there'll be a black town car out there ready to haul me away in the trunk. <laughs> Oh, good question. Are, is Rita's, since they're uh, semi-national, are they making the same ice everywhere? Yes, they are. And they're making a Philadelphia-style ice. It would be the eight pounds of sugar. I think it's ready to come out. Okay. Rod says it's ready. Turn off the refrigeration. Can you stand inside so you can see this? Is there a lock on this? No, just yank it. It's uh, just iced up. There you go. Look at that. Pour it out fast. That is ready. All the way. Look how quick that comes out because of those large openings. And it's got all the pieces in there. It's beautiful. Now, let me just show you something real quick. Let's make it a sorbetto. Now it's a fruited a strawberry sorbetto. Isn't that great? All I did was change containers. There is no difference. I had this uh, discussion with the, the chairman of the board, my counterpart, with Capigiani. And I said, you got to take down your advertising. You're saying you invented the batch freezer, and we patented it in 1905, and your guy didn't copy our exact design until 1919. He goes, oh, well, it's different. We're making gelato. I said, you mean milk, cream, sugar, and skim milk? Oh, but we do it differently. Uh, I'm still waiting. They did take it down. They didn't say they invented it, because we did. And that's, see, there's nothing left in there. It all came out so fast. So, uh, we're going to have you try it. Uh, do you want to try it? And we'll try it in squeeze cups. You just squeeze it up from the bottom. As opposed to squeezing it up from the bottom. <laughs> I won't give you a huge amount. Because I don't want to spoil your lunch. Hmm? Thank you, sir. And I'm going to rinse this out. Rod, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, how about your email address? Let's get everyone out of the way and we'll, t we'll take care of that. Okay. While they're getting this, I'm going to... Does anybody... Would, they, would you prefer the sorbetto? <laughs> you can charge twice as much for sorbetto as you, t as you can for ice. Absolutely. Who'd prefer the sorbetto? <laughs> oh, definitely out. We'll put Rod's formula up on the website for you, uh, so you'll be able to copy it down there. Well, the problem, you're not Italian. See, if you're Italian, you know, it'll be genetic. You Can know I put this up this. in front, like this? Yes. You know, you don't hear I'm calling it Presbyterian. So this is uh, my business card with my email address and phone number. The email address is oh, R Oranger. Probably it's about O R I N G E R. Dollar seventy five. Uh, uh, I R I C E C O dot com. If you have any questions or you'd like recipes, no, a couple of please contact me via my Three email. Gallons. That'd be the simplest way yeah. for me to respond to Yeah, you. about two dollars. But it, it gives you, by putting the fresh fruit in it, it really does.
What else? Yeah, we See, with our machines, you can make a, uh, a product that is wonderful to sell at Yankee Stadium. Something cold, uh, on, in a hot environment, you, where you don't want great quality, you just want something cold. Or you can make an Italian ice that is going to have them lined up down the street. And that's what we're looking for. Well, I'm looking for both. I'm not going to save it. I, I only save the ice cream. Too much sugar for me. Is that close, Steve? It was. What are you doing there, cleaning? Yeah, Rod, why don't you just finish up by telling everybody where they can get you, and I'm going to clean this up, and then Jeff is going to take your microphone and take over. So my email address is, again, ronger at iriceco. The best way to contact me is through that email address. Uh, I have lists of recipes for 25 different water ice, sorbet, Italian ice, Danish ice, Greek ice recipes. Not only using our uh, water ice bases, but I also have a recipe sheet using concentrated liquid flavors. If you send me uh, an email, I'll be glad to send you all the recipes. I've also developed a, oh, actually I wrote this years ago, Steve, you remember the guide to making ice cream? Yeah. That you used as, do you still use that? Yes, yeah, yeah. very good. So I, I have a, a recipe book for making ice cream as well as a guide to working with uh, ice cream, uh, with ice cream equipment, ice cream mix, and how to handle those products. So, and spell uh, out again the uh, email address. It's roranger at iriceco, that's r O-R-I-N-G-E-R at iriceco, I-R-I-C-E-C-O dot com. Yes? Um, I see the bubblegum flavor is just concentrated. <coughs> yes. Because it's so small, I easily shift it, you know? Do you have anything like a strawberry lemonade that's a concentrate like that, or does it only come Yeah, to yeah. repeat the question. Oh, sorry. No, so the, the question it. is, uh, do we have water ice bases in smaller containers and gallons? We do not. Uh, and, we, and, and for the concentrated flavors, we only sell those by the gallon also. Okay. okay. You know, flavors do not have to be refrigerated, but I do recommend refrigerating anything. I mean, you're going to get a longer shelf life if you refrigerate the product. If something comes in a number 10 can, you all familiar with the number 10 can? Let me show you a number 10 can. That's a standard size of the industry. That you'll hear it called a number 10 tin. This is a number 10 can, number 10 tin. It holds three quarts of product. Okay. Once you open a number 10 tin or can, um, if you haven't used the whole can by the end of the day, you need to repackage it. Put the product in some sort of plastic container or glass and refrigerate it. Uh, the, if you leave a product in a number 10 can, it'll pick up uh, a little acid note, a little tartness, okay? Ron, thank you very much. Rod, thank you very much. <laughs> Steve, did you let Sadie come in and have a little? No, that's my job. That's your job. Now I'm going to uh, have you turn the mic over to Tie-Dye Jeff. And those of you who uh, haven't yet been introduced to Tie-Dye because you're living in the eastern edge of Mongolia, uh, tie Dye runs an extremely successful ice cream parlor, and as I mentioned before, he's open very specific hours and is making adult flavored ice creams and gives large portions, and they're just lined up. This community that he's next to is, is fantastic. It's uh, heavily advertised. It's a retirement community, and everybody owns their own golf cart, and there's just thousands of people. And Jeff won't tell you this, but you know some of the background of it is uh, when you get a little bit older like Rod, not me, um, your, your wife starts to, your significant other, your spouse starts to control your intake of food. My poor father uh, at age 90, he lived to be 100, at 98 my mother was uh, still having him on uh, uh, bean sprouts and, 
and seaweed. And he would say, Evelyn, I got to go down to my car because I, I, can't, I can't find my glasses. I got to go down to the car and get my glasses. And she'd say, Ted, they're on your head. And he'd go, oh, well, these are the wrong ones. Well, dad had a stash of cookies and candy and cakes in his trunk. He couldn't drive anymore, but he was going down there to get some real food. But anyway, as we get older, the significant other, your spouse controls your diet a little bit. And so you have a, a lean meal and maybe a glass of wine with it. And uh, that's it. You're cut off for the night until Jeff came along. And then uh, one person says, to you, hey, you know what? Let's get in the golf cart. Let's go over to Jeff's place and just get a little bit of ice cream. It'll, it'll top off the night. Well, ice cream's OK. Everybody knows it's not fattening and it's, it's healthy for you. It's all these great products. So they all come over to Jeff's place all night long, long lines uh, to buy his ice creams, and, and they really are fantastic. So, uh, and we have nicknamed, nicknamed him tie-dye, and I think you can see why. Yeah, is that for me? No. Oh. When we're going to break, right? He does. No, you're going to make an ice cream now. I thought we were going to break. We are. We're going to a coffee break. That's what I said. Okay, so you make, you close us out for the coffee what break. What part didn't I get here? Are we going to a break now? We'll go to a break. Okay, I want to keep when we come back ahead. from the break, I'm going to disagree with about 95% of what you heard, uh, <laughs> but I speak the truth. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to take $1 in your business and just being simple, I'm going to show you how to make your $1 by working them correctly and then unfolding them right in front of your customer's eyes. You're going to see how to make your $1 <laughs> into ten dollars. Wow. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, uh, one question. Uh, Jeff, how far is your place from here? One hour. One hour. And he's got room in his class tomorrow, so you ought to talk to him. We're going to take a quick coffee break, use the bathrooms, walk around a bit. Uh, we'll reconvene in about ten minutes. Just stretch your legs. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know my philosophy, and that's not to, uh, uh, well, let me rephrase that. My philosophy is to use everyday items to make ice cream. It keeps your cost down. It keeps your flavor more familiar to the public. I think when they can taste in your ice cream what they've been used to tasting, like an Oreo cookie, a real Oreo cookie, or real peanut butter. Or, I was in the supermarket last week, it's a true story, and I was looking around, as I always do, for stuff to make ice cream out of, which is, if you've read my book, uh, just to another shameless plug, it says right on the cover, uh, make incredible ice cream without buying jugs, cans, or jars of flavoring or coloring, go supermarketing. And that's what I believe in. And I think in the supermarket, whether it's an American supermarket, Asian, Mexican, Latin, whatever, you can find incredible stuff for desserts. So the other day I was walking through uh, Walmart, actually, and I came across their version of no-bake cheesecake. So I figured, cheesecake ice cream, that's got to work. And the, the uh, opportunities are endless. So this box was $1.88. This box was $2.18. This is the Jell-O brand. So normally, I would buy this, but I splurged and I went for the good stuff. I have since tried both and they're both exactly the same. They're fine. Now the trick is creating a recipe. That's, that's what people are a little afraid of. Uh, and obviously, another shameless plug, I run a boot camp. One of the things that we do is show you how to create a recipe. It's very important. So here I am with a box of cheesecake uh, dessert by Jell-O, a no-bake mix, and I've got to turn this into ice cream. So, upon opening the box, isn't this interesting? Fascinating. Upon opening the box, I find two packets. Uh, you can guess what they are, right? One is the cheesecake mix, one is the crust. So, what I did, without a scissor nearby, is I opened them both up, And I stuck my little finger in to see if it indeed tasted like cheesecake. And 
surprisingly enough, it does. So I took this and in a small sample, uh, uh, creating a recipe is a little more complex, but I figure it out and it's very, it's simple once you know how to do it. Uh, but I poured the cheesecake mix and the crust mix in there. And then you can use, uh, where am I off, over here? Uh, okay. So from the side, you hear me saying that we're going to put up a few shelves now. No, just kidding. What we're going to do, I started out with a food processor. I bartered ice cream for a KitchenAid uh, from one of my customers, and that worked well. And then I decided to be a purist, and I went with um, hand whisks. And I'm a gadget kind of guy, so hand whisks, they're beautiful. There's a lot of beautiful hand whisks out there, and I bought good ones. And then my arms started to get tired. So a friend of mine gave me this idea, and it seems to work pretty well. Where do we plug into? Uh, there should be a plug right there for you. Under here? Try up top. Ah, box. okay, Alec got box. it, got it. And if you go to Home Depot, <laughs> these are paint mixers. They're stainless steel paint mixers. And if you just cut them down a little bit, they attach to any drill. <laughs> Isn't the life great? And now, you can mix up in a few seconds what used to take me a while and kill my arm. And there it is. Kind of cool. And there it is. So it's a $3 paint mixer in Home Depot. So we have... Uh, I'll give you the recipe for this. We're using uh, seven quarts of mix. And actually, since we're using seven quarts, we're gonna add a little more of the cheesecake mix because my recipe calls for five. Steve asked that I do seven, so we'll add a little more of this. And what we'll add is probably half as much because five to seven Right? Are we close? Is this an oil painting or an audience here? <laughs> so we'll add a little more. Uh, and usually I'm a measure freak. Um, these are, what, four ounces? Three and a half ounces. Three and a half ounces. So we're going to add three and a half and seven. Like we, we measure, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes out. Approximate. And don't worry about uh, uh, mixing it up too thoroughly because Steve's machines uh, are ridiculous in that they do all the work for you. Uh, the chocolate chips, by the way, uh, one of the things uh, Rod did was ask about putting the chips in. It's actually better to put them in the machine because now the machine will make you all different size chips, which in a homemade ice cream, I think people want to see that rather than every chip be the same size. And by the way, to clean it is amazing. Just drill it under water in the sink and you're there. Life's great. So uh, all of my ice creams, uh, certainly all the ones in the book and all the ones I still make have basically three ingredients and that's it. Uh, and one of the ingredients is obviously uh, the ice cream mix. Now when you pour in mix, if you've got two things like this, just because the nature of the machine, pour in the purer one first so this stuff doesn't sit on the bottom before you start mixing it. Just minor, but it helps. And of course, always make sure you have a barrel under here. So this is the 12 quart? Yes. Okay, we're adding it into the 12 quart. This is pure mix right here. Only because I didn't have a container big enough to hold everything and make it easier. Uh, 
get yourself some of these and they can squeeze so that pouring isn't as messy as normal. So when you're adding this, now what I do is I turn the machine on as I'm adding this. So again, it, it starts mixing it right away. Why did you bother blending it before you put it in the machine? Isn't the machine well, it's, the machine will, but it's a powder, and any help you can give it is better. Okay. Uh, I also think I save a little on electricity by doing it by hand before I add it in the machine. I just don't want anything gumming up the machine at all. Uh, it'll blend concrete uh, with enough time. What speed do you want this on? About I don't have one of these on my Emory Thompson, so I'm roughly always... Roughly 170. 170 for premium ice cream. Give or take. Give or take what? Five. Okay, so let's go to 170, give or take nothing. <coughs> His next version, you'll be able to just press in the number you want. Maybe I'll <laughs> press in the flavor you want. There you go. So now we're adding this mixture of uh, cheesecake mix. and 10% uh, ice cream mix. And I've always used 10%. Okay, we're good there. Now, obviously, if it's cheesecake, everybody has a favorite kind of cheesecake instead of plain, so you can make cherry cheesecake, strawberry, blueberry, you can make anything. At the store, I started to make turtle cheesecake, uh, which is this cheesecake ice cream with caramel and fudge through it, and it's really a good seller. Uh, today, we're going to make cherry cheesecake. And I also bought Smuckers, which is as pure as you can get in the store, and good stuff. And I also brought a little of the juice. At, in the store, I, I make ice cream with uh, fresh frozen black cherries. They come in a, one of those bags in the freezer section, and all it is is black cherries with juice. It's no sugar or anything else. So I save the juice from it. And, uh, and I add a little of that just to get a little more flavor. So, we need a small spatula. I say we need a small spatula. And everybody's not rushing here, so... I guess we don't have one. What we'll do is... <laughs> <laughs> easier to make a $1 bill into a... I'll get you a small No, I've got to have something spatula. better than that. bigger <laughs> job. <laughs> so we'll add, <laughs> oh, who would eat it after that? We'll add just a little flavor and we'll taste this before we finish it up uh, so that the flavor is all there. And we're ready to start our freezing. How many of you, out of the 3,500 people here, how many of you own an Emory Thompson yet? Okay. You know you all will. Uh, it, there's just no substitute. So we'll put this on, and, un, and unlike Steve, I don't time it. Uh, I use a forward timer rather than a counting down timer because uh, I just want to know about how long it's been in there. So I'll just check my watch. And uh, okay, it's six minutes of. So, so now we can start making our variegate as it's called uh, and I have a different way to add this into the ice cream which you'll see and this is just Smucker's cherry jam cherry preserves the jam doesn't have the pieces in it the preserves does
Now what we're going to do to make this smoother and spreadable is we're going to add a little mix. Fascinating. And we'll start up. You'll get to know about how thick you want it. This is pretty, pretty good here. All right, now we're ready to do that. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Get the health inspectors around? Yeah. Drills, Absolutely. Repeat the question. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the drill bit for health inspectors. Uh, it's stainless steel. I sterilize it uh, just like Steve sterilizes everything else. I haven't had a problem. Uh, I get inspected often, no problem. Uh, it may not be NSF because it's not an NSF application. It's a paint uh, mixer, but it's all stainless steel. And if you, you know, just like this spoon I used, it's not NSF approved. It's a spoon. Uh, so I don't think you'll have a problem. If, yes. if you didn't want to do it that way, you could go to the professional chef and buy a mixer for about $200. So or, you all all or, or you can use a whisk. Or you can use a whisk. But this is a fun idea, and it works well. Go ahead, ask. No, no, I was just going to say that you can use an immersion blender, too. It's the same thing, basically. Yes, that's right, an immersion blender, right, right. Uh, whatever works, I just, I do this so often. I make ice cream pretty much every other day. And I'm making, oh, 30 gallons every other day. And I use a lot of, you know, whisking, and my hand hurts. You know, my arm gets tired, my hands cramp up. So this is just another tip. Uh, those of you who, who will get to work with me, you'll have hundreds of these tips, and I think they're great. They, I wish I had known them in the beginning, but I'm not the brightest guy. I learn by my mistakes. Uh, just like on this thing here, get a piece of that rubberized uh, draw liner, you know, and just cut a, a strip right across there, and then nothing will slide around like it does here. I use those on top, I use it up here. Uh, for my, I always keep a, a spatula and a plastic container up there <laughs> uh, so that when I'm moving this away, I replace it and the, drips, the drippage is a minimum. Jeff, tell people how you started the business because you didn't start with the uh, 24 cord. No, I started with a, uh, actually I, I came here, sat in the chair right where that gentleman is over there about 35 rows up for those of you who aren't here and uh, I watched Steve make ice cream just like you all are and uh, probably like you all I left here saying I can do better uh, I can make better ice cream than that uh, in no difference to him he's a machine maker and he makes the world's finest machine there's just no argument about that well I thought I could make better ice cream so I bought a countertop unit uh, Not that one, the, C, the next one over there. This one, that's right, a countertop unit. And uh, I put it, I had it installed in my kitchen. The truck comes, the lift gate goes down, the guy wheels it in and I realize I can't plug it in. <laughs> it's 220. So I had called up an electrician, I had them put a 220 line in my kitchen. I bought a tarp, I covered the entire floor, taped it around, and I started experimenting. Uh, I bought all the books, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't care for the, the the method that they used, so I went shopping and I started buying uh, things in the supermarket: peanut butter, uh, Oreos, uh, all sorts of stuff. And uh, and then I started making ice cream. 
Uh, now, it happened to have been in December a few years ago, and the first thing, one of the first things I started experimenting with was champagne, because New Year's Eve was approaching. Well, I came up with a champagne ice cream uh, that is ridiculously good. And uh, we were invited to a New Year's Eve party, and I brought a three-gallon tub of champagne ice cream. And it just, it was an incredible hit. And I knew right then that I can be in the business. Uh, so I perfected the formula on that. I went from there to wines. I use wines, I use uh, uh, liqueurs. Uh, that's why it's an adult ice cream store. Uh, and then also I made other things. I, uh, I, I make the world's best coconut ice cream from supermarket products uh, with real coconut. And it's just ridiculous. Now, I added uh, our own homemade fudge swirl to it, and it became Mounds Bar. Uh, so anyway, we've got, uh, at any time, 35, 32, 35 flavors of homemade ice cream all the time. About half of them are adult flavors, half of them aren't. Uh, and when I started, uh, I took Steve's advice, although he doesn't mention this anymore, but Steve used to tell you that you should go and market your product to restaurants, hotels, country clubs. So that's what I did. Uh, from my kitchen, I moved into a room in the back of a gym. It was eight feet by 10 feet. And you had to walk through the gym to get to my little room. And I had a sink, now this is a true story, I had a dental sink. It was nine inches by nine inches square. That was my sink. Uh, and I had the ice cream machine and a refrigerator freezer that I bought at a flea market. And I took my product and I went to restaurants. And they loved it. And they said, yes, we'll take it, we'll serve it. So I, I built up an account of, say, five restaurants, five popular restaurants. Uh, most of them were Italian. Uh, so one was a chicken wing place, uh, popular, uh, but the Italian restaurants. And, uh, and then my job was to keep them filled in. So I would give them, say, three flavors each, and three times a week, I would go around and check the product to see if they needed more. Well, don't you know that every time I went to check the product, uh, it had frost on it, the covers weren't on it, the, the scoop was laying there looking very bad. They just weren't taking care of it because the servers were uh, younger girls or guys, and they didn't care. They didn't know how to handle ice cream. And I was getting very discouraged because my product was being ruined. I would take out the frosty one, put a new one in at my expense, because, you know, you can't charge them for it. So after about a month of that, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. I took, I closed all the accounts, I took all the ice cream out. And here I am in an eight foot by 10 foot room. You hear that? You can almost tell when it's ready. Is slapping against the sides of the And it's uh, almost cover. ready. So then I figured out, well, I've got this investment in a machine. I'm paying uh, $400 a month for this room in the back of a gym. And uh, I better make some money. So uh, word of mouth was spreading because I was giving everybody in the gym ice cream to take home. And people were realizing I was there. And I put a sign out front, one of those sandwich signs. I put it on the street uh, that we have ice cream. And people started coming in. Uh, this is something that you'll get to know how to do. It's, it's, it's just feel. Now, in my opinion, if you let it go 45 seconds too long, the ice cream's done. It's, you dump it, and you start over. It's no good. It tastes like butter. I'd rather have it a little softer. Steve likes it a little harder. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> So what he's right is when it breaks, see it's starting to break when it's a good firm break, <laughs> this very sexual ice cream we're making here, when it's a good firm break, nice and hard, it's ready to work, to work with. Uh, okay, I'll continue the story, I don't want the ice cream to, uh, to go bad. So my method of folding in, uh, I guess we both come to the same ending, but my method's a little different.
Jeff, would you want a timer on the machine that would shut the machine off at a specific time every time? No, you can't. It's not. A, it's not science. It's art. I mean, to me, anyway, I couldn't do that. Why? You're thinking of doing that? No. Uh, it's just that uh, other manufacturers don't realize that when you go changing the sugar content of the product, it changes the freezing. Well, time. and the time of day, the humidity in the room, how many people are in the room, uh, your body temperature, everything changes it. Okay, we're going to make, uh, I need one more container. Uh, let's use a gelato pan so people can see that. Ah, good idea. That. Good idea. Okay, we are ready to go here. Almost. So here I am in a 10 foot by 8 foot room. People are walking through the gym to buy ice cream cones and little dishes of ice cream that I was selling for uh, three prices. Two dollars, three dollars, and five dollars. You can guess what I sold the most of. And that wasn't cutting it. So, So I decided to, uh, uh, it was pretty good traffic coming through the gym to my little room there. Uh, so I asked the landlord, can I have the front so I have a door to my little ice cream business? And he did, he uh, doubled my rent. I went from 400 to $800. And he gave me the two doors, seven feet back, and I had a counter. And that was my store. It was seven feet from the door to me and I had the room in the back to make product. Now I gotta tell you, this is not on a main street. This is off the beaten path, and we'll get into that in a minute. It's one of the notes I made before when the guys were talking. Okay, we are ready to roll. It's exciting, isn't it? Okay, so first you turn off the refrigeration, and then you let her rip. Cheesecake ice cream. And now I take this, uh, you can stand up again, and I simply well, pour it on the top. Yeah. And then you fold. Uh, four folds is usually good on it. And these bowl, these things for squeezing are great because as you squeeze it, you're going to get a beautiful ribbon of your variegate, or whatever, I don't know what it's called, in there. Swirl. And then your swirl. And that's what it'll look like. Beautiful. So that when it freezes, it's great. And it took me two years to figure out how to do that. <laughs> it, I'm not kidding. It took me two years. I didn't know how to do it. So anyway, and then obviously you do it again. And that's what I say you'll learn how thin or thick you like it. And then you give it a stir, a fold, sorry. And same thing, you squeeze and it creates a beautiful ribbon. And that way everybody who eats it gets a pretty good share of the flavor. And that's that. Should we taste it? You bet. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, just remember, the whole thing is it's a very simple business. It's not an easy business, but it's very simple. Come on up. Uh, don't we have a big spoon or something? I got it. Thank you. And obviously you can add any flavor 
you want. I've done blueberry cheesecake and uh, turtle is a big favorite at the store. And when you have a, uh, a favorite customer, you can always add a little I know, she knows. more of that stuff. Mm -hmm. She can have a little of this. She can. There's no chocolate, right? Yeah. Which is going to get very little. And damn, that tastes just like cheesecake. Now, Jeff, you didn't add any vanilla to this one. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. You could, but I just, some I do, most I do. This right. one I didn't. Okay. It's not that I forgot it. I just, uh, I like that cheesecake flavor so much. Is that good? Okay, that's all. See, we don't even need a dishwasher. <laughs> we just put it right back in the shelf. Don't anybody give her any more. That's, that's her limit. Now Jeff just speeded up the machine to get the last bit of product out. Yeah, Sadie, Paul is here. Paul, oh, with cheesecake ice cream? Uh, no, thank you. Huh. <laughs> Last time I offer you anything. <laughs> and that's that. Great job. That was very clever. And uh, I'm going to put this in the freezer for now for it to stiffen up a little bit, and then I'm going to put it in okay, you know, I'll more make containers you, and give it to I'll my friends. I'll make you one more i got room for. Excellent. Let me just show that again, how beautiful that is. Look at that. That is nice. I'll leave you your spoon. Can you put that in the freezer for me? Right behind you. You can add one more. There you go. Jeff? That was pretty good, Jeff. Yeah. That's good. When you're buying products from the supermarket, how do you determine your cost breakdown and your cost you want some profit? Good question. How do you determine your cost analysis for all the different products you buy? Uh, it's sort of a philosophical answer. Uh, I use the best products I can. And I know that if I sell enough, I'll make money because this business is inherently a money maker. Uh, if it costs me $20 of ingredients to make a batch of ice cream, I come out with seven gallons. So, and I sell one size. I don't have different sizes. I sell one size, six bucks. Now that includes the tax. So, so the, uh, uh, just, just throw a stool right in the middle of my train of thought. <laughs> Go ahead, do it again, seven, seven do it bucks. again. So if it costs me $20, which is give or take uh, with everything, then I know because a, a gallon is 128 ounces, I serve a healthy portion, so I get about 10 servings to a gallon. Uh, I keep my things in one gallon containers. Uh, it, it helps me to know everything. Uh, what my cost is, what my inventory is. I have nine freezers that I use uh, so I know where everything is. Anyway, getting back to the question. So if it costs me $20 to make seven gallons and I can make uh, 128 ounces in a gallon and I get 10 servings per gallon at $6, that's $60 times seven gallons is, work with me here, $420. So I'm not going to worry too much about my cost. Uh, that's not a triple net. That doesn't include the electric and the, and the uh, help and everything else. Uh, but it's a pretty good. Uh, if you do it right, if you're selling ice cream, you don't have to worry about it. 
unless you're on a corporate level where there's backers and they want to know how much you're making, you'll make money. I made money from day one because I make a superior product. Uh, it doesn't matter, in my opinion, no deference to these guys, it doesn't matter where you are. Your location doesn't matter. If I asked every one of you 3,500 people here, if they had, in their lifetime, a great little Italian restaurant that was off the beaten path, but it was mobbed every night, you'd all know about it. Mm -hmm. Because people will come. You build it, you do it right, people will come. There's only three things you gotta remember in this or pretty much any other business. Make a superior product. Make the best product you can. Charge a fair price. Fair, fair to you and fair to the customer and treat everybody like family. You do those three things, you can open up anywhere. Just make sure that you do those three things. Make the best product you can. Just walk right in front, it's all right. <laughs> make the best product you can. Absolutely the best product. That's why as far as cost, I don't worry too much about it. I want the best product. I want that customer leaving saying, wow, this is amazing. So make the best product you can, charge a fair price, and treat everybody like family. Yes, ma'am. Jeff, have a seat. We're going to sit down and answer some questions for a while. And then all right. We're going to break I, for lunch. All right. I just want to get some water into the machine. Okay. Your question. Um, how nice can my That's uh, selling by weight versus size is a big controversy. Uh, people, uh, customers of mine, have been pushing the idea of by weight for years. And the rationale is, well, we buy meat by weight. We does buy. Anybody like, excuse me, does anybody like when you buy anything and the guy puts it on a scale and then takes a little off and get. Nobody no. likes that. That's nobody right. likes it. No, I don't yeah, buy but it. Here, here comes the problem because you had set in your mind that you're going to bring your family of four into this ice cream parlor knowing that they sell a product for $3.50 and all of a sudden you get a bill that's higher than that, you don't know what you're going to pay until you get to the cash register. And that bothers me and it bothers a lot of people. The reason that uh, every 10 years this issue comes around of should we sell by weight is quite frankly because the management is lazy. And the management is lazy because they can't, they will not train their employees to scoop the same size scoop all the time and the proper method. Uh, it just is something, it's, it's not, you know, when you go into the meat market or the supermarket and you buy uh, ground meat, uh, you have a good idea, it says $1.99, you have a good idea that it, two pounds is going to cost you close to $4. If it's four and a quarter, so what? I, I, I was buying fresh fish the other day and it came out a little higher and I said, well, that's okay, I like fresh fish. But in an ice cream parlor, you, you can't get away with that. You can't, say, go into Starbucks and say, uh, well, we're going to fill this cup up and uh, it's going to cost you $1.98 one day, it's going to cost you two thirteen dollars the next day. It's too confusing for people and, and quite frankly it all comes down to not training the personnel. Along that line, if I can borrow a tub here, um, when you scoop ice cream, ice cream has air in it. Air is not a bad thing. Uh, my father was called down to a Senate subcommittee hearing one day back in the 60s because some southern senator said, them, them, uh, them uh, dairy people, they's cheating the public. They're putting in air into the ice cream. Well, if ice cream didn't have air, just like if a birthday cake didn't have air, it would be a pound cake. And that's fine if you want to sell pound cakes. But most people would prefer birthday cake as opposed to pound cake. So we have a tub of ice cream. It's at, say, 70% overrun. And we can explain the term overrun, if you like, when we answer questions. Here's your tub. Uh, to make this motion to scoop is quite easy. You've got a lot of strength in your inner arm. Never get in a fight with a lady who scoops ice cream. She'll knock you out cold. You got a lot of uh, strength right there. Can I borrow your pen? Go home tonight because the proper way to scoop ice cream is in a semicircular motion like this. You're rolling the ice cream into the scoop so that Jeff made it say at 70% overrun, it's staying at 70% overrun. If I go from here to here, it's going to from 70 to 60 to 55 to 50. We don't really know what that scoop cost because we just, the server just changed it by compacting it. Here's the problem. Going like this, take, go home tonight. Don't do it now, you'll embarrass yourself. Take a pen and in the air, go like this for five minutes. You will curse the day you ever heard of me because that hurts. 
your muscles aren't good like that. And the second you leave, your employees aren't going to go like that either. They're going to go from north to south. So build an ice cream and build a cost basis on what this looks like and show your employees that a scoop of ice cream, thank you, a scoop of ice cream uh, should look like this. I went to um, the Culinary Institute of America up in Hyde Park. Uh, they have our machinery and I was shocked one day uh, and, and the more I think about it, the more sense it makes. The way they teach the chefs how to make a filet mignon or a beef bourguignon is they've got pictures on the wall and they say this is what your product should look like and you almost have to do that with your employees. Jeff's training, he, he's, he's the kingpin and he trains his employees well, but they're trained so that every uh, portion looks the same. Uh, lazy management doesn't want to do that and I know we've gone full circle on should we sell it by the, the ounce or should we sell it by uh, one scoop, two scoops, or three scoops. I still prefer one, two, and three and I don't call them small, medium, and large because small can make, if you're a group of friends, uh, he's cheap. Uh, medium, okay, I'll go for medium, large. Uh, if, if you uh, had an extra slob. couple of pounds on you, you're a fat slob. So one scoop, two scoops, three scoops, and you don't even go that far. You sell no. one portion, one size fits all. Right, I started selling three sizes. Uh, I also don't sell ice cream cones, eek. Uh, but I'll tell you why in a minute. But I sell three, I, I was selling three sizes, two dollars, three dollars, and five dollars. And of course, Steve's right. If, if, you, if, if you want people to order the, the large one, they're going to be fat slobs. They're not going to do it. They won't, they'll do it if they're alone and they're leaving, but they won't sit at the table ordering a fat ice cream. The little one is uh, the kids eat it, but I also found that people come in and they'll order a small. And I'm not going to make a living on $2 ice creams. It's very difficult, uh, unless you're on the boardwalk, Times Square, or Las Vegas, whatever. So I cut out the little one. I had $3 and $5. This is over time. And then, you know, just one day I sat up and said, what am I, nuts? They're coming into my ice cream store for ice cream. They're going to, now, no offense to the customer, they're going to take what I have. So I had one size, $5. And that was it. And I went two years, one size, $5. The tax was included because I didn't want the girls to have to wrestle with change. At one point we did, it was $5.35, uh, you know, the tax 7%. And between the change and everything, it was no good. So I decided to accomplish two things. I raised my price to $6, but I included the tax in it. So it was really like a 60 cent increase in my product. And there I am. Now I sell it for $6. Shakes are six dollars, uh, and ice cream is six dollars, all kinds. Some cost me more than others, and I know that. The girls who work there don't. You know, they, they're just not in that mode of thinking how much things cost. But I know how much things cost, so I have a specials board. And if I want to sell, and I, like this is a pretty inexpensive ice cream we just made. Very inexpensive ice cream. But it's a good ice cream. So I have no problem telling the girls, hey, let's sell cheesecake ice cream tonight. And it's an easy sell. Uh, we have 35 flavors. And a lot of people, we put our flavors on boards. They're nicer than this. This is a couple years old now. Uh, but I put them on boards like this. And I have Velcro on here for when I want to change or I'm out of a flavor. And I don't put it above the counter where people order their ice cream because they'll stand there and clog up the counter and they can't make up their mind. So I put it on the opposite wall. So the girls all night are looking at the backs of heads. Uh, but I, anyway, I put a specials board right there too on an easel. And anything that uh, I have a large supply of, if I want to get rid of a flavor, if I want to promote a flavor, I put it on tonight's specials. And it works pretty well. And I, I and the girls have no problem pushing one over the other because in my opinion, they're all good. I, I mean, I think I make the world's best ice cream. Yes? Same price for a special, or you make Everything is $6. How many ounces? How many price ounces? Question is how many ounces are his um, portion? It's, uh, it's just under a pint. Uh, and it's served in a homemade, fresh waffle bowl, which in turn is placed in a sugar cane bowl. Uh, Non-edible, but it's a, a green product, a sugar cane bowl. Uh, and that's it. And it's 6 bucks, And we sell... 
you know, 100 a night, uh, so people like it. And some ice creams cost me much more. When I make uh, my Bailey's ice cream, that cost me about $50 to make that. Um, but it's one of our big sellers, and it, it's offset by this, which cost me $3 to make. So uh, you're okay. Just make the best ice cream you can. If you don't like it, don't sell it. And I dump a lot of gallons down the drain. When I make, sometimes when, I'm sorry to go on and on. Sometimes when you make, no I'm not. <laughs> sometimes when you make an ice cream and you taste it when it's first out of the machine, you love it. The next day when it's frozen, it loses a little flavor. It's just inherent in the product. And it's not up to your standards. So dump it. It's hard. It's hard dumping seven gallons of ice cream down the drain. But do it you'll feel better about it. You have to do that in business. I can't make a, a product line of say six machines and then say, well, you know, the seventh one isn't up to right. standards, but you know. They won't okay. notice it. No, they won't <laughs> notice it. You're judged by what they last purchased and it's, it's gotta be perfect. Uh, you're, you're in business, you have to have consistency, a perfect product and a fair price. And on that change thing, watch me get in real trouble with women. Uh, if, if the price is five dollars including tax, which I really strongly uh, am in favor of. Uh, give you a quick example, I was going through Tampa International the other day and this was a uh, dollar ninety-eight. So I give them two bucks and, and that's it. I'm getting ready to go through security. I don't want, well I go back the next uh, week and it's two dollars and twelve cents. Now I've got all this change in my pocket, I gotta pull it out through security. Women will keep change, Paula does, and when they get in line at the grocery store, they're picking out, you know, the change. Boy, Men, don't they do it. five right. bucks, here you you're go. Absolutely You know, right. if there's anything over, keep it. I just wanna put down the money and get out. This is the way men are. And your customers, if it's uh, $4.98 plus tax, gee, I didn't expect to pay five fourteen for this product. That, that's over a $5 bill. So I like to include it, I like to have a set price, and it comes down to training your employees. Train them Way in the to back. get the size right. Jeff, the mix, you said you usually go with a 10%. Correct. 10%, uh, 12%, 14%. Correct. Do you think by your ingredients, you can uh, use a less, a cheaper mix? Okay. What's the Let me handle this. Answer the question. Let me handle Tell this. The okay. First. He asked, uh, I use a 10% mix, and the inference, <laughs> the inference was that it's a cheaper mix, uh, and that Psychologically, 12 and 14 are better mixes. Well, let me say this. Can I give a short story? Sure. Okay. Uh, about six months after I opened, and, and I used 10 because Steve said 10, and that's what I've been using. Six months afterwards, and I told you I make the best coconut ice cream in the world. I'll tell you how I make it later. It's in the book. <laughs> uh, a guy walks in, a big, tall Hispanic gentleman, and now I'm in Florida. I'm in central Florida. And he said, you have coconut ice cream, I see. I said, yep. He said, well, I'll take some coconut ice cream. So I give it to him. Now, this is a true story. I swear to God this happened. He tastes it, and he looks me right in the eye, and he said, 18, right? It's a true story. And I said, right. He said, I sell ice cream up and down the state of Florida. I represent ice cream makers, and I'll sell your coconut ice cream because I've never had a better 18% butterfat ice cream in the world than your coconut ice cream. The point is... You can make anything into anything, especially with Steve's uh, infinite overrun on the machine. You can make your ice cream as thick or as thin as you want. Uh, you can make it so a, a, a hammer will stand up in the ice cream, or you can make it a little softer. It's up to you. The flavor is not going to be dependent upon the butterfat. Uh, it's much easier, I find, to work with 10% than 12 or 14. My supplier once delivered 14 to me. and what the heck? So I made ice cream out of it, and I dumped it. It tasted buttery to me. It was, it was phlegmy. Can you say that on TV? It was, it was thick. It was no good. And I dumped it. Uh, and I swear by 10%. I, y there's not a person in the world, whether it's Rod, who's been in the business for 35 years, anybody that can come in and tell me what percent I'm using. We sell in New York 16% butter fat. And you're not going to believe the reason why. It's not because it's richer or it's better. It's because the this guy next door is selling 14%. And we have what I call the fat wars. Uh, if he's selling 14, well, by gosh, I'm going to sell 16 so I can be the richest ice cream in New York. 
That's the only reason. It's not better. It to me, and everybody has personal taste. It, to me, it has a greasy taste on your butter. palate. Yeah. It tastes like butter, and yeah. I want to be refreshed after me, my eating my ice cream. And also, the higher the fat content, the more flavor you have to use just to cut through the fat. You know, it's not, you're not using, you know, three ounces more vanilla to make it better. You're using it because the fat content is so intense that you need it just to stay even with where you were at the 10%. Now, that's a complete change from uh, when I lived in New York. New York, like I said, 16% or nothing. Don't even bother me with anything less. Uh, down here, the reality is uh, the 10% is what's making a, a, a great, great product. But nobody can tell the difference. No. Nobody. I defy anybody to come to my store and tell me what I'm using. And I'll make three different ice creams. I'll make 10, 12, and 14. I'll make 16. You can't tell. Although you might think that the 10 is better. Mm -hmm. uh, Another thing about Jeff's store is the menu is limited. He doesn't have 35 flavors of ice cream. He doesn't have... Yes, I do. You have that many now? Yeah, 35. On any given day? Every day. I didn't know you were that big. Every day, 35 flavors. Oh, well. And I we got them all. Higher. We got them all. <laughs> Every day, 35 flavors. I'm proud. Well, Very good. It is what it is. You yes. Them well. If the higher butter fat is your only option, how can you thin that out at all? With milk or skim milk or anything? Sure. Why bother, though? You're paying for the 16. Why not buy something the less? The question is, can you thin down a higher butterfat content down to a 10? We'll just buy 10. I don't know if the price is different. Is the price different for 10, 12, or this 14? This was 6.60 uh, a gallon, and um, I believe the, the higher ones are going to go up around close to 10 right now. That price, by the way, varies. Uh, this summer it was up to uh, 11, 12 dollars. Uh, it's, a, it's wonderful that dairy product varies with the market. <laughs> Cows don't always produce the same amount well, of product. Well, mine doesn't vary. Well, that's the dairy, our dairies, uh, steady customers keep it as low as they can. They average it out. But other places uh, in the country, they see p uh, price spikes like crazy. She, what she said, and I didn't catch it the first time, excuse me, was if she had no other alternative but to buy 16th. That was the only thing in the ah, market. Ah. Uh, yes, you could thin it out. Uh, I, I would recommend skim milk because, like I said in the beginning of this, skim milk is heavy cream with all the fat removed. Uh, you, if you talk to a dairy scientist, they're going to cry that uh, you're throwing the mix out of balance. But again, Nonsense. who, who knows? It's, it's your taste. I've got a customer out in Cincinnati who uh, has got a sweet tooth, and he takes a standard mix that he's buying from his dairy that he likes and adds corn syrup to it because he wants it sweeter. I think it's just horrible, but it's what he wants. Who else? Uh, we can also talk about, uh, besides butter, uh, butter fat, uh, we can talk about sanitizing machines. Uh, you now, know, speaking of sanitizing the machine, just one second. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve and I differ uh, 180 degrees on this. He sanitizes his machine in the morning before he makes product. Right. I sanitize mine after cleanup the night before. Right. Uh, just and that's, you're absolutely wrong. Well, uh, apparently I am wrong, but uh, w I use Clorox to sanitize my machine. Uh, and I just can't even envision sanitize, cleaning a machine with Clorox in it and then putting your mix in and make an ice cream. Ah, uh, it gives me the willies. So I do it the night before. It's, it's just as clean. I mean, it's sealed up. It's sealed up the night before. Yeah, it's not just as clean. Theoretically, I agree with you. But the health department doesn't agree with you. As far as the machine itself, stainless steel and the plastics that we use are non-porous. Uh, you can take the uh, blades in this and put it into the, the cheapest dye that you can possibly find and leave it there for a month, and they'll come out pure white. Uh, other cheaper plastics that people use, they'll turn pink. There is no porosity in, uh, in the machine, so the Clorox isn't going to be a problem. The theoretical reason, and I, I can agree with you, uh, but the theoretical reason why health departments say sanitize before you start the is because the bacteria is going to grow. Theoretically, bacteria could start, you know, let me get horribly graphic. Let me say I just cleaned up after Sadie and I didn't remember to uh, wash my hands. How horrible can you get as an example? But that's, all, that's horrible. But if I sanitize first, um, then, you know, just before I start, then I know I'm starting off with an even playing field. However, just to have the last word, <laughs> you can sanitize uh, and then you're not supposed to rinse again before you pour your cream in. Uh, and if I put my nose in that machine, I smell Clorox. 
That's the problem with using Clorox. It's, no, it's, it's the same intense. thing with all the stuff. No, these, these new sanitizers are not uh, anything like that. They're not as strong. I'll give you, they do as good a job, if not better, because they okay. also eliminate I'm too cheap. Up. I'll give you some free ones. Done. I'll take it. <laughs> Who else we got? Yes. I'm sorry, keep going. Um, health department, what do they do as far as their inspections for these machines? When they come in, what do they, what do they do? What, how, yeah, could you say you... Okay, I'll answer that. The question is, uh, what do the health inspectors do when they come in as far as your machine? And the answer is nothing. Okay. Uh, their, their concerns are the temperature of your freezer. I got cited once in three and a half years. Do you know what I got cited for? My spatulas were upside down in the bucket, meaning that he said, you've got to grab it by the spatula end, so they've got, because I need more room in the bucket. He said, no, your whisks and spatulas have to be face down. That's what I got cited for. The machine, they don't. You mean they were just sitting there? I keep them in buckets. I'm a spatula freak, so I have 30 of them. And I keep them in buckets, but I like to see what size I have. So I have them pointing up so I can grab the one I want. Can't do that. You have to grab it by the handle so the spatula part has to be down. And then you can't see what spatula you need. It's, so do they come in while you're in production? Or just they can come in any time they want. Yes, They However, come in here, and I am certified as a wholesale operation here, and Sadie is verboten. She is not allowed to be in the building. So uh, if I, and I am not in commercial production, but if I was, they'd pull my license because Sadie is in this 20,000 square foot building. So it depends on the health inspector. I had an health inspector, Jeff, this will get you. It all depends on the inspector. And I had a machine, this is 30 years ago, up in Buffalo, New York, and it kept coming up with a, a bacteria count. And it was driving the customer crazy. It was driving me crazy. So I flew up there to Buffalo, not the garden spot of the world, to see what was going on. I said, the inspector's got to meet me. The inspector shows up. He's got you know, horn rim glasses. He's got the black briefcase. He opens it up. And he pulls out a Ziploc bag because he's going to take a sample of the ice cream coming out of the machine. And he go gets ready to open the bag. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, <laughs> and he takes his hand and shoves it into the bag like this, going, oh, damn allergies. I did not just sneeze. I was showing it. He opens up the bag like this with his hand and then takes the sample and sends it off to the lab. I said, there you go. It's his fault. The, the, the best thing you can say about inspectors is you have to work with them. I mean, their goal is to give you a clean operation. I've seen some operations, some of the finest restaurants in New York that I won't eat in because they're just, I mean, one of them closed down, Tavern on the Green, filthiest place on earth. I would not eat there. And uh, their concept is to be there to help you. Now, they can get overzealous. Some of them might be looking for a, you know, a 1 to turn into a 10. Uh, but some of them are just, you know, most of them are just worried about their boss. They don't want their boss coming in and say, why'd you, why'd you allow him? And so the easiest way to work with a health inspector is keep a clean operation and listen to what they say. If the guy's got a thing uh, about spatulas being down when they ought to be up or vice versa, do it his way. You know, get it out of the way. They're a pain in the neck, but most of them, I describe them as being 23 years old, dry, carrying a big book like this of rules and regulations, driving a Ford with no chrome on it, and enough authority to keep you out of business. They're but, not the end of the world, but you've got to work with them. And, you know, their ultimate goal, if their hearts are pure, is to, you know, have you produce a clean product. That's uh, right. Something that's not endangering the health of the people. So, for the most part, they're fine. Yeah, I found what they check is they have that digital gun, they want to know how cold my freezers are. I have nine freezers. Uh, I don't believe in blast freezers or dipping cabinets, that's a whole other story. But uh, they take their gun and they read the temperature. I keep my freezers at different temperatures depending on what I need to use them for. Uh, and they always question that. You know, why is this one at zero, this one's at minus eight? And I explain, you know, that's what I need. Uh, but they check that. They check the, uh, I don't have a floor drain. Uh, you know what a floor drain, obviously. I have what's called an air gap. You know what that is? Uh, uh, if you rent a place that doesn't have a floor drain, you have a floor drain here? I have two. It's a, it's a blessing to have it, but I didn't have it. So I had to, the plumber had to make what's called an air gap. I have my three bay sink, which goes into one, and then that pipe doesn't go into the floor. 
the, the question that they have is if there's a problem in the line down the road in the city or something and it backs up, it's going to contaminate your product. So they invented something called an air gap. The drains come out of my sink and then there's a gap before they go in. And you can see the water, uh, there's a gap of maybe two inches and it falls into the pipe which does go into the ground. And the theory is, if there's a problem down the way, it's going to back up and it won't go into my sink. It'll come out that air gap. So that's what I have. And they check that too. And it, it's a big pain in the neck, that air gap, but it's what I have to it's live with. It's hard to keep clean. Oh, it's what I have to live with. The it's digital terrible. gun that you mentioned, I have one. I can show it to everybody later. We, I had one up in the Bronx. They're great. They're so much fun. Guys, go out and get one because you can aim uh, it. No, and don't can, go out and get one. <laughs> go to the dollar store and get little cheap thermometers and just put them in each of your freezers and you can see at a glance what they are. How much was me, that little gun? Let, oh, $70. You didn't let me finish though. Okay. I use mine. I go to the welder up in the Bronx. Eh, he is alive. <laughs> I thought he was dead. He's just standing there and moving two hours. How about the polisher? Yeah, well, he's still alive too. They're very helpful. I'm a big advocate of keeping it cheap because, you know, it's a very, very easy, simple business. You know, you make the product as inexpensively as you can to make the best product you can. And that's where all these little things come in. A dipping cabinet. Can I expound on that a little sure. bit? Sure. A dipping cabinet. Uh, you walk into every ice cream store in the world and there's a case with a plexiglass top and it has 16 or 32 flavors sitting there. And they never all look good because when you open for one, you're opening for 30. So the air, which is your biggest enemy in ice cream, is getting into all of them, and it's creating frost in all of them, and it's melting a little bit of all of them. And if you're really busy and it's opening and closing all the time, all the time, then it's doing your ice cream a big disservice. Uh, so I don't use dipping cabinets, and it saves you a lot of money. There's five grand in your pocket. I, I like the, um, <coughs> I like what I call the old-fashioned cabinets, like Jeff has, where the lid flops over on itself or something like that. Anything but the, it's called a visual display cabinet. Because you run into a problem where you've got as many flavors as Jeff, people will stand around and stare at it and, and try to decide which one they want. And they and want if, a sample too. Oh, if you make the mistake of saying you can sample something, you'll get people coming in sampling 10 flavors and then they're full and they leave. No sampling. No sampling. Uh, but that ties up the line. It's better to have nice looking <laughs> signs and what a great idea to have the signs not near the ice cream like you did so that people can study it and say, okay, that's what I want. I know what I want. I'm coming in for mint chip. I can bypass those people who are studying the signs right. and get right, right online. Right. And with the dipping cabinets, everybody stands there, especially children which aren't allowed in your store. And, uh, well, and you're constantly cleaning fingerprints off it. I believe that dipping cabinets, and this is... Uh, no offense against any of the people who sell them, and one of our friends, Neil, sells them. But he sells both. Uh, right. But dipping cabinets are a 100% waste of money. Uh, what do I do, you ask, right? Uh, well, I have nine freezers. Now, up front, where we serve the ice cream and the girls dip it, there are two Sam's Club freezers, $180 Sam's Club freezers. They each hold 22 gallons of ice cream. And on the top, there's, uh, like that, only smaller. That's a big one. Uh, and they each have a piece of paper that's scotch taped on the top with a map of where everything is. And everything is in one gallon containers. Cambro uh, is where I get the containers, C-A-M-B-R-O. And they make all different sizes, by the way. But the one gallon, it works for me. Uh, the girls, when the people tell them what flavor they want, if they want caramel crunch, <coughs> The girls know that it's in this freezer here. They look where it is. They go right to it. They pull out one gallon of ice cream, put it on the counter, open the top, and dip from one gallon. Then they have a spade uh, so that they go down on the sides to keep it compact, the ice cream in there, and they put it away. Uh, the most that I'm going to lose out of one gallon is, I don't know, two ounces in the bottom. Out of the large buckets, you're going to lose a lot of ice cream. Uh, but there's no waste in my ice cream. And it's the fact that they can't see it is what led me to make such beautiful. This one isn't. I, I have to bring you a new one. The new ones are glossy and they're very colorful and they're beautiful. But that's, that's my dipping cabinet right there. It tells you the flavor. It tells you what's in it. It's uh, hopefully a little clever. 
and it's pretty to look at. And I have five of these up there with my flavors because they each hold six flavors and I've got five on each board. That's 30 flavors and our special board always has another four or five. So we always have 35 flavors of ice cream. They're all fresh. Uh, and they're in one gallon containers. No I was need on, for a dipping cake. I was on Boca Grand Island, Paul and I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, where good conservatives go to vacation. And um, there was an ice cream parlor there, and they had the display cabinet. And first off, it had about that much ice built up on the walls. I once read that for every uh, quarter of an inch of ice built up on the walls, there goes 10% of your efficiency. That's horrible, plus it looks bad. It means you don't want to maintain your equipment. And you get down to those last few scoops, and do you really, as a consumer, <laughs> want that last scoop? I know, as a manufacturer, it's as good as the first scoop, but it's down at the last scoop. And then you get someone who's real clever, so they think, and before it gets to the last scoop, they take the tub out, bring out a fresh tub, which is filled right to the top, and then take the old ice cream and mound it on top. And you know, anybody who's in the business knows that's the old ice cream from the other one. You don't have any of these problems if you don't use the uh, visual display now, I, I do get ice building up on the, the walls of my freezers, uh, and I defrost them once every two weeks or so. I take all the tubs out, put them in other freezers, unplug it at night, the pool of water in it in the morning, clean it out, and I'm ready to go again. But the frost doesn't touch the ice cream. You also don't need... Uh, what, what do you call them? Blast freezers? Um, yeah. What, what else? Hardening are they cabinet. Hardening cabinet. Blast freezer, freezer, hardening cabinet. Right. Flash There's another $6,000. Uh, I, I just think that, that it's such a simple business and you keep it simple and you'll make money. You know, we all like ice cream. That's why you're sitting here. That's why these 3,500 people are here today. We all love ice cream, but we want to make some money, don't we? So keep your costs down, keep your product at the highest level and you'll do it. And I, I just don't see the need for anything, any of these, these accoutrements. Blast freezers are necessary as the business grows. Uh, my um, principle of doing business has changed radically uh, in the last five years, which happens to coincide with President Obama being president. Oh. The economy has done very poorly. And where the 24 court, the larger version of this was the standard of the industry, now it has switched to the six court. Uh, something happened when I designed the six court uh, four years ago. Um, I brought it out for high-end restaurants. They didn't want this model, the 12, uh, which makes one tub, because they said, we want smaller quantities of ice cream. So great, I'm going to make a six quart machine, makes uh, uh, half a tub, six quarts, and the restaurants are going to love it. Well, the economy came along, and it wasn't the high-end restaurants buying the machine. It was people out of work. Paul is waving to me that it's lunchtime. Okay. Um, the, the people, people are out of work. They do not want to go on welfare. They want it, or they don't want to stay on welfare. They want to be an entrepreneur. They want to get into their own business, and they don't have any money. This was exactly Jeff's situation. Now, he's got a lot of offshore accounts, but he pleaded that he has no money. So I am putting, I have put over 2,000 people into business with the countertop machine in just a couple of years, and it did something else for me. My machines last 45 years. I sell Jeff a machine, and I say, hi, see you in the next life, uh, because the machines don't wear out. Now, they can buy a machine for under $10,000, it gets them into business. They work long hours. I had a customer call up a few days ago. He bought the machine in March. He's running it 18 hours a day, seven days a week to keep up with his demand. That's fantastic because what does that mean? Yeah, he's exhausted. But it also means he's making money. He's making a lot of money. And as his business grows, he can spend money on things that will make his time more efficient. So he's ready to buy the next size up. Hardening cabinet, you might have to buy a hardening cabinet as your business grows, just so you have inventory. But otherwise, the way Jeff's talking, who makes ice cream daily, uh, he's correct, or he's, he's not wrong. So every uh, business is unique to well, their I've, situation. I've got 11 to 1,500 gallons of ice cream all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, if I have a, an electric problem with a freezer, I'm not going to lose all my product. How fast do you move it, that 1,100? Uh, every week. That's the difference. Other people aren't moving it as but fast. But they will if, if, you know, if they do what we tell them. <laughs> if they make good ice cream. Well, That's right. if, they, if they do, it's a simple business. <coughs> just, you know, just make great product, 
charge a fair price and treat people like family. Uh, another sh uh, subject came up that I wanted to touch on. I want to show you something. There's a group that uh, I belong to, and uh, Rod Oranger also belongs to it. It's called Ice Cream Folks at yahoogroups.com. And once you open up your business, you can uh, join this group. And this started up in the Boston, Massachusetts area, a bunch of ice cream people. And remember, I had said, uh, it's a very friendly business. You can get a lot of information, but you can't walk into someone's store and ask them questions. They just don't want to tell you. Uh, this group, you can get uh, a lot of uh, answers from of all different things. And so I, I recommend that. But we were talking about a subject the other day that I found very interesting. Jeff, come on over. You've got to talk about this one. The question was, What's better, to have young ladies serving ice cream or old coots like uh, Jeff and me? Careful. All right. I'm not an old coot. I know. Thank you so much. Um, the answer is, is, a, is a very definitive yes. Uh, they're both good. Uh, people like to know that there's an owner there. Uh, they, they, they like dealing with Emery Thompson because they're going to talk to a Thompson. Uh, there, and we don't have answering machines you're going to get directly through. Yes, we have a sort of answering machine. If our lines are all jammed up, your call actually goes to my computer, and I see it right there, and I call you back as fast as I can. But in an ice cream parlor, people like to know that there's an owner. It's, it's almost like the uh, TV series Cheers, where everybody knows your name. Um, I grew up in a town where we had a meat market, we had an Italian deli, we had a shoe repair, and you knew the people there. People like to deal with the owner. So if you can be in the business for a few hours, or one person wrote in Ice Cream Folks, he said, it's just not possible for me anymore to be there every day. So what I did is I put up a sign that said, I am here Tuesdays and Thursdays from 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. Please come in and ask me any questions that you have. Uh, so as far as personnel, there's nothing like the, the personal touch. That's what makes you an entrepreneur, that there is someone there. Go ahead. The answer to that is you can't be there all the time, so you've got to groom a store manager and make that store manager the, pe the person that people ask for. In my case, I have a couple of girls, but I have one that people would almost rather see her there than me because she's built up that kind of, and the, the way to do it is give her responsibilities. The more responsibility you give uh, even a young girl, the more they're going to feel that place is part theirs, and they're going to project that to the customers. The customers are going to see that, and they're going to want her to be there. So I'm there. I do tabletop magic. I walk around all night and entertain. I don't dip ice cream anymore. Oops, don't worry about it. I won't worry about it. Uh, but the girls who work the counter uh, and the girl who works the register, uh, people love them because I've, I've, hopefully I've groomed them well, and they take part in the store. And what Jeff says is it all comes down to training. I have an ice cream parlor out in Los Angeles, La La Land, and I have had 15 calls from them from the, over the last four weeks. And it's always the same thing. One day the uh, CB350 runs for 15 hours making ice cream, and the next day it freezes up solid. Huh. A machine is a machine. It doesn't have a brain that says, I think I'll work today properly, but not tomorrow. But the day after, I'm going to work fine. And over and over again, it's the same thing. Very simple. They're putting the blades on backwards. Remember I said it's got a little curved part? Well, this isn't a lesson right now on how to put the blades on. It's a lesson in training your personnel. It's wonderful if you have a great manager. You have to, McDonald's spends a lot of time training people. They and put subway. you down in the basement and you watch videos all day long. If you, if you are going to rely on other people, which of course you have to do, uh, especially as the business grows, you've got to train them in the job that they're doing. You can't just say, oh, thank goodness you're here, I can go home now. Uh, you have to train them what to do. And on a machine as simple as the CB350, it's a matter of does the blade go this way or that way. It's not that hard. It's not, it's not rocket science. But it's the difference between the machine making ice cream one day and, and not making it the other day. So um, management is, is always from the top down. If you're a cranky, mean person, so are your employees. If you're a good person who likes cleanliness and runs a tight shop, then all your employees will be that way too. It's all about the training. Everybody is inherently a good person, and everybody inherently wants to learn. It's a matter of are you willing to teach them.
Um, I don't know. Can, can you hear that in the back? Uh, it's it's the uh, organ. Do you know about the organ here at the Tampa Theater? Okay. It's a Wurlitzer. It's a it's a giant Wurlitzer from the 1920s. It has uh, what did I hear? 200 mm. pipes attached to it. You're it's delusional. It's got 23 different voices. And if you stop and listen right now, I think you can hear it. Well, that's our signal. That oh, that's, we're gonna have lunch. that's the post-production stuff, right? Oh, we're going to lunch. Okay. All right, we're going to have lunch for you. Okay. Get off. Afterwards, I'm going to make you a breakfast ice cream. Hi, friends. Over the past year, I've received many calls and emails from people interested in opening an ice cream store or those who have just opened one and aren't doing as well as they expected. So during the past year, I've traveled to many places throughout the country helping people open their store or planning to open their store. Two things were wrong with that. First of all, it cost them a lot of money to fly me out there, rent a car, rent a hotel, put me up for a couple of days or whatever, uh, and the, the cost was prohibitive. The second thing that was really apparent was that they weren't getting any real world experience. That's when I began Mystic Ice Cream Boot Camp. This is a 14 hour course in a working ice cream store, my working ice cream store. We'll keep the store closed for the entire day and open it at night. Uh, this way we'll have a classroom type atmosphere the course will be from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. with four participants maximum. Those four people will go through everything here uh, and then at 6 o'clock from 6 to 10 they'll actually participate behind the counter of Mystic Ice Cream serving people, greeting people, dipping the ice cream and handling the inventory and the cash register. In short they'll do everything that has to be done to an ice cream store. At 10 o'clock we clean up. Uh, we'll have the sanitary conditions in an ice cream store are paramount. There's a lot of dairy, a lot of sugar, so we'll have to do that. What they'll learn in that day, in that full day, is the complete startup costs of opening your ice cream store. Not any ice cream store, but the one you're planning on opening up. We'll talk about finding and more importantly scouting a location. We'll go over your legal options, whether you want to become an S-Corp, a, a partnership, an ownership, a limited liability, all those options that you will have. We'll talk about how much lead time you have before your store opens, and again, more importantly, what to do with that lead time. We'll go over the regulations, licenses, and permits that you'll need. Now the equipment. We'll talk about what equipment you absolutely need and, just as important, the equipment that you absolutely don't need when you start up a business. We'll go through your initial supplies and a list of suppliers. Then we'll talk about money, making it, counting it, and keeping it. In short, you'll have a complete store organization. We'll go through your inventory, the advertising and marketing and promotion exposure that you will need, and of course the ones you don't need to spend money on. We'll also talk about employees, hiring them, keeping them, what salary to pay them, and also how to get rid of them. We'll go through the daily money handling, which means you'll actually work the cash register, you'll know how to change the tapes, you'll know how to do the accounting at the end of the night, and you'll know how to make your deposits. Then the big topic, sales tax, we'll go through that as well. The store will be closed to the public for the full day and only open at night. In short, you'll learn if this business is for you. In one day, you'll know. You'll understand how to plan it, how to open it, and how to run it. You'll also understand how to make more money than you ever thought you could in this business because it is extremely profitable. You can tie it in with a trip to Steve's seminar if you'd like, uh, and we can do this one day prior I'll run the class and one day after I'll run the class. So the boot camp can be either on a Tuesday or a Thursday, or contact me for dates. Uh, I've arranged with local hotels here for discount rates. Uh, you'll receive the boot camp workbook, which will be personalized for your operation. You'll also get a copy of the Mystic Recipe Book with more than 20 great recipes that will easily carry you through your first year of business. 
you'll get an organizational CD. We'll have lunch, snacks, and dinner. The cost is $500 per person or $750 for a husband and wife. For more information or to book your date, just contact me at xhippie at aol.com. X-H-I-P-P-E-E -E at aol.com. Thank you. Okay. We're back on. Uh, we've just come back from lunch. You got to see the video of Tie-Dye Jeff's uh, ice cream parlor and his business. And I tell you, I can highly recommend it because it's, it's difficult to find a place where you can uh, do live training in a store. And, and Jeff accepts people in and does a great job. Thank you very much for your time. It was nice meeting you all. Feel free to contact me with any questions. Back to the cold north. Even you, Steve. You Good to see you. Time. Good Pleasure. to see you. Ken, nice to see you. Rod Oranger. Thanks, Rod. Welcome. We'll see you Good soon. to see you. Salt to caramel. We love it. Thank you. Bye. So, uh, you saw the tape about Jeff's business. Uh, also, you got treated to a little bit of the uh, organ music at the Tampa Theater here. So, we're back to the huh? snack. What did you say? Never mind. We're, you got to move, you got to keep up. Uh, so, we're back to making ice cream. And uh, I'm going to make uh, a product I was going to make first thing this morning, but we had to move the schedule around. Uh, a little bit. I was going to make you a breakfast ice cream called Grape Nuts. Grape Nuts ice cream. I got it. Didn't sound very interesting to me at first until I did some research on it. Uh, you remember Grape Nuts. It's what our, uh, all our fathers used to eat. You know, the stuff is horribly crunchy. I'd send it to my friends after they'd had uh, their wisdom teeth out just for fun. And um, it's a very crunchy cereal and it's a very popular ice cream up in New England. And I never heard of it down here. I never heard of it in New York. But I did some research on it. And I found out it was first made in 1909 in Newfoundland, up in you know, the Canadian border. And um, very popular way back then. And it spread down through New England and is a very popular flavor in New England. And then it seems to have jumped completely from New England down to the Caribbean. And in Jamaica, they uh, said, well, the grape nuts is great, but let's add something that we have a lot of in the Caribbean and the South, and that's bananas. So let's add some bananas to the grape nuts, and I call it a, the perfect breakfast. You know, second only to beer, it's, it's, it's a wonderful breakfast. So we're going to make grape nuts with uh, bananas in it. And just before I get this going, I was asked to touch on uh, gelato a little bit and explain some more about what gelato is. For the last, uh, th through the 90s and uh, mid 2000s, uh, gelato was all the rage. And uh, some of it was real, some of it was hyped up. Uh, I always use the example. People say, I just got back from gelato, from Italy, and the gelato was the most fabulous I've ever eaten. It was fantastic. Why can't we get anything like that here in the United States? Well, some of that is. Uh, Cynical me comes back with a retort because I was in the Bronx underneath the Third Avenue elevated subway. And I'd say, let me ask you a question. Where does a Heineken beer taste better? Uh, on a Caribbean beach with the sun and the surf uh, or under the Third Avenue elevated subway in the Bronx? It's the same beer, but of course it tastes better in the Caribbean. Everything tastes better when you're on vacation. But the Italian flavors are quite unique and they're very good. Americans sell uh, mint chip, Oreo cookie, uh, Jeff's flavors. The Italians are selling uh, tiramisu, uh, hazelnut, fruit of Bosco. Fruit of Bosco, just, I love the name, it rolls off the tongue. It only means mixed berries. Uh, they have all these different Italian flavors. And I think they're wonderful. Uh, they're delicious. Uh, the Americans don't make Italian flavorings. You have to get them from Italy. And anybody who tells you that they've got secret flavors from Italy and secret formulas that nobody else knows and they studied for years and years, well, the Italians with their gelato are very serious-minded. And as you can tell from watching this, we're kind of cavalier about it. But their flavors only come from uh, three companies. One is Monte Bianco, which uh, is uh, got offices down near Miami. And uh, boy, they've got a peppermint that is unbelievable, a peppermint paste. Uh, the other one is uh, Pre-Gel, and uh, this is a company that is really huge. I don't know a lot about them. I haven't used a lot of their product, but my customers say they really like Pre-Gel. It's great. They have about five factories 
around the world, which makes it easy to get. We just sold a machine that shipped out of here yesterday to Japan. And even though I had a preference for another company, he said, well, Pregel's got a factory right in our place in Japan, so he's going to buy from Pregel. Let's open it up. Sure. So that's Italian flavorings. Um, my problem with Pregel, Jeff, is it comes with no instructions. So <laughs> Does it come with what flavor it is? No, I don't no. know that either. So it's a real guess. Oh, here you go. It's hazelnut. But it's certainly a company worth looking into because a lot of people use Pregel, and it's great product. Uh, according to my customers. And I give recommendations based on what my customers tell me. Um, the other company that I'm very familiar with is Fabry. The Fabry family began in 1905, the same year Emery Thompson did. It was Mrs. Fabry over in Bologna, Italy. And uh, they're right next door to Capigiani, the Italian batch freezer, right next door to each other. So no wonder they uh, recommend Capigiani batch freezers. But I don't care. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in giving my customers the very best they can get. I don't care who they're you know, aligned with. But the Fabry flavors are fantastic. And uh, there is Fabry North America, which is uh, the North American arm. Uh, they're still made in Italy, but the offices are up in New York. And you can always email me and I'll get you that address. Um, or it's also on our key supplier list at emerythompson.com. But they have these fabulous pastes. They're quite expensive compared to American flavors, but you use less of it, and the, the flavors are just great. Um, gelato, again, the Italians, you know, they put on their white coats, and they got this thing of spectrograph or something like that, and they're measuring butter fat, and they get all serious about it. Uh, true Italian gelato, like you would find over in Bologna or Florence, uh, is going to be uh, about a 7 or 8% fat content. Um, here in the United States, uh, we run 10% because it's a very common percentage. And the difference between 7% and 10% is so negligible, I don't think you could tell the difference. And if it allows me to uh, go to a local dairy and buy a 10% instead of using this powder, as we discussed this morning, that I have to reconstitute with water, and, and who wants a powdered ice cream? I mean, really, if you're buying milk at the supermarket, are you going to buy milk? Or are you going to buy non-fat dairy milk that is a, this, this is a powder too. And if you mix this with water, it becomes milk. But you know this isn't as good as uh, fresh milk. And this is a great product, but it's not as good as fresh dairy. So I still use a dairy, and that means I'm kicking up the percentage uh, by about 2%, and that's all. And then I'm using the Italian flavoring, and uh, it makes uh, a wonderful, wonderful product. The air content coming out of the Italian machines is 55% overrun is what the Capigiani machines do. We do as low as 35 up to 100, so we can make a richer, denser gelato than any of the Italian machines can. It's all up to you what you want to do. Um, if you're planning a gelateria, that's the be all and end all, a 10% mix. The Fabri flavors or the pre-gel flavors, the Montebianco for some of the paste. Um, and that's the whole story right there. It's not rocket science. It's really very simple, just like when Jeff makes ice cream. Uh, his formulas are great. He's worked on them. And once he's got the formula, it's pretty easy to follow. You have Jeff's book. It tells you how much of this to use, and there you go. Um, Jeff, someone in the back just looked confused, like, Jeff's book. What's Jeff's book? I think you missed someone. Uh, Jeff has a book. Uh, that has his recipes and he's got a new book coming out and um, it's fairly priced according to Jeff. You know, he's got this new Mercedes he's got to pay yeah, for. I'll handle this. <laughs> well, all right, go ahead. Thanks, I've got it's, a book. It's, it's just a of, short ad. I'll handle this. I know you do nothing uh, short. <laughs> uh, it's a book of uh, the 20 recipes that got me started. We still serve these 20 or 23 recipes today. They're, they're, they're timeless. They're very good. And it's got tips and tricks on suppliers, who to use and everything. This, uh, this one book, no problem, will put you in the ice cream business. And it's very simple. It's got different, uh, uh, it's very good. You have to understand, when I first met Jeff, he was working on the corner of 57th and Lex, and he had a headband on. He's working a table with a three-card Monty. Going, see if you can pick where the card is. You know, and uh, he's, 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 he's moved uptown a little bit, but he's still the same guy. 
Um, but the point is, with good flavoring, you can really do uh, just great gelatos, great ice cream. Now, I do have a problem with gelato, and this is not for the folks who are doing uh, gelato for their, their primary business. This is for the rest of you doing ice cream parlors. Um, I sat down with the chairman of the board. Yeah, we collude, we fix prices. We do all these evil things that big business does, or at least we pretend to. Uh, I sat down with the chairman of the board at Capigiani in New York over tea uh, one day. I was having you know, real good, strong burned coffee and he was having tea. And I said to him, how many gelaterias do you think there are in New York City? We got eight million people. How many gelaterias are there? And he thinks and he thinks and he goes, I'd guess you've got about 100, 125 gelaterias. I said, we have three. And no, excuse me, we have, at that time, we have five good gelaterias. And by the end of the year, there'll only be three. He was shocked. He couldn't understand why gelato wasn't just everywhere. If you look around today, all those gelatos and all those gelato machines, they're gone, except for my customers. My customers did it right. And here's what went wrong with gelato. The product is great. However, um, it's, it's got two major problems. One is it's very narrow casting the market when you open a gelateria. I walk into your gelateria. It's, it's Paul and me and <laughs> Sadie. And I want uh, hazelnut gelato. <clears throat> Paula wants mint chip ice cream. And Sadie wants uh, a cherry Italian ice. You're a gelateria. You are silently saying to us, Go away. The, you know, Paula, Sadie, you go away. We don't have anything for you. We sell gelato. And so you're sending two-thirds of your business away because you're you, you've got yourself locked into this upscale attitude that we only sell gelato. So we don't have mint chip. We don't have Oreo cookie. We don't have Superman Italian ice. I, I got to tell you, I have never seen a situation in all my travels where you've got a little five-year-old tugging on his mother's dress saying, Mommy, can I have a tiramisu? <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't happen. So my point is uh, you have to have, if you're going to be a metropolitan ice cream parlor, uh, you, you don't want to be just a gelateria. You're too locked in. You're just gelato. I would have some gelato, I would have some hard ice cream, and I would have some Italian ices, if that's what your market will bear. In Jeff's business, it's straight ice cream, that's what his market demands. But uh, for a lot of other businesses, I wouldn't do just a gelateria because I want a little more spread than just tiramisu, hazelnut, and, and some of these other flavors. It's, it's just a little bit too narrow. But the product's great, and with an Emory Thompson, you've got a machine that can make a better gelato than they make in Italy. Uh, because we can control the air content better. We make it faster than they do, so that means the ice crystals are smaller. And we build a machine that's going to last 45 years. And <laughs> one other thing, they cost less. They cost a lot less. We build them here in the United States. We don't sell through dealers. We only sell direct because I want to talk with you. Uh, I don't want someone who uh, sells uh, gelato machines and refrigerators and microwave ovens. I want someone talking to you who knows the business and, and just the business. So we have a lot to offer there. So that said about gelato, I'm going to now make this uh, grape nuts ice cream with the bananas. And you'll see, just like uh, Jeff's formula, some of the best formulas are the simplest. So I have to step out for a second and get the ice cream mixed. Do you want to entertain? Yeah, go okay. ahead and sell them something. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> Don't take too long. Jeff, can I ask you a question? Keep the door open so I can hear. So, is there a difference with the road run between machines, or is it just really with the speed of the blade? Or the, what creates the overrun? The air. The air. What creates the overrun is the question. Uh, Think of, you know, those things that whip whipped cream with the three blades coming down. If you uh, do that, you'll get a certain amount of whipped cream. If you take one of those blades off and you do it, you'll get less whipped cream. If you use a single blade, you'll get less whipped cream. So it's just putting more air in. It's not more whipped cream. It's more air in the product. So by having the beaters turn faster, you're whipping more air into the product. And uh, you can make... Uh, now my machine doesn't have the infinite overrun on it, so uh, um, so I can make. Uh, uh, I don't know how should I tell this. My machine doesn't have it, uh, 
Uh, so go ahead, finish that, Steve. So you're limited to how much variety you can give, but you have picked the type of ice cream you want to do and you stay with it, so that machine's fine for you. Correct. So Jeff's talking about off uh, camera buying <laughs> Here's a new I get machine. a pie on my face. And, and, and what kind of deal can I get on a new machine? It's normally because Jeff is set in his ways, which is good, he's set with the type of ice cream he's going to make. He's not going to do something radically different five years from now. He doesn't need the infinite overrun control. He's all set. But for a new business starting up, we don't know what's coming down the road. When they came out with NutraSweet, that had a whole different uh, uh, freezing profile from anything else on the market. And the infinite overrun was able to adjust to that new product. So let me ask a question. Without the infinite overrun, can the machine make Italian ices? It, oh, absolutely. Okay. That, that's without the Italian the, ices are made. Right. Without the infinite overrun, can it make premium ice cream? Yes. Okay. So there you go. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. I just, it's, it's nice to have it, but you can certainly get along without it. But it's nice to have it. Right? Would yes. you say that? Oh, yeah. Okay. For the price, I would always have it. Of course. <laughs> this is, I just wanted to show you, this is something that I made over Christmas uh, to give out as Christmas gifts because I'm a cheap, you fill in the last word. Um, and this is just a uh, pie crust, a graham cracker pie crust that I bought at the supermarket. And I filled it with uh, my key lime ice cream recipe, which is an offshoot of Jeff's. Not as good, but it was darn good. And I gave these out as presents. You just uh, hold it under the machine and fill it and throw it in the freezer. And then you deliver them around, and uh, it sure beats a tie. And uh, I've also made these uh, for New Year's. I made them. Uh, I made my decaf coffee ice cream pies, and I made vanilla pies, and just sprinkled some little, uh, you know, little multicolored sprinkles on them. Which up in Boston they call them Jimmy's. Jimmy's, right? I have no idea uh, why. Uh, with regard to that, Steve and I. Steve doesn't even know this, but about three months ago, uh, my wife brought home a pie crust in a tin foil with the bubble plastic on it. Uh, actually, it comes with the plastic inverted in it. Yeah, right here. Uh, and they're $1.25. And I told her to go buy 40 of them. And she did. And uh, I have a better way to fill them. But we sell ice cream pies now, and it's probably 30% of our business. We sell the ice cream pies for 10 bucks. They have a label across the top with the flavor on it, out the door, 10 bucks. I even made uh, one of those big signs with the current flavors and I Velcro tonight's pie flavors on there. And anytime you make ice cream, what I do is I put it in that big bucket that, you know, the, the three gallon that we ran off the cheesecake ice cream in, and then I simply line up the pies and do this. And then uh, on top of each one of them, you put uh, whatever respective flavor it is. If it's my cherry cheesecake pie, I put a few maraschino cherries on top. If it's a chocolate chip, I throw some chips on it. But just a little bit, not a whole topping. If it's the turtle cheesecake, a little caramel and a little fudge. And they're flying out of there. Uh, I give the girls a buck for every pie they sell. And the beauty of this for the consumer is you take it home, and there's something about you know keeping some ice cream in your freezer, and you get down to the last third, and you start feeling guilty. But this one, you can slice it in any size uh, portion that you want at home. So after you've eaten a portion, you go, well, I didn't cut that very big. I can give myself another one. And so you can go cut off another piece. So people love to have this. This, and was, this was a big hit. Believe it or not, there is less ice cream in there than in my portions. Uh, and what people sometimes do is they come to the store, they get a pie, and they sit down with two spoons across from each other, and they eat the pie, which is okay. It's $10, uh, whereas they might have split an ice cream for six. So I'm okay with that. But ice cream pie, whatever flavor you're making, just draw off a little extra, put them in your inventory, in the freezer, stack them up, and there you go. You have another business. And it took me three years to figure that out. Just out of curiosity, how much does the pie crust cost? Dollar twenty-five. Walmart. And they're great. Walmart's oh, a buck and a quarter. So it's your six dollar ice cream plus a dollar twenty-five and you sell it for ten. Uh yes and no. I save money on the pies because it's a dollar and a quarter. I'm not giving them a fresh waffle bowl or a um, um, a, a sugar cane bowl or spoons. Uh, and I, I went over the edge, I went to Restaurant Depot and I bought boxes, pie boxes. So now when they get a pie, $10, which includes the tax, the pie goes in a box, out the door. 
Is this going to be enough for your next secret? Oh, sure. Okay. Oh, sure. If you'll put that in the uh, refrigerator for me, then I can talk without okay. being interrupted. <laughs> See you in a few minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, now we're going to um, make the grape nuts ice cream. Real simple. Make sure the gate's closed. Just pour your dairy in. I'm going to just, there's a little safety guard here that moves out of the way so you don't put your fingers in the machine. And you just pour that in. Okay, now I'm going to add uh, some vanilla to this. Uh-oh, here she is. Hi, Sadie. Okay, does anybody see the squeeze cups? Yeah, put them behind you. Put them behind you. Oh, right there. Great, thanks. Now I'm going to follow Jeff's rule. He puts an an ounce to a quart. A quart. So I just put in three and a half ounces. I've got five quarts, so I need another ounce and a half. This really makes a difference. This may, this really changed my ice cream. When Jeff said that I made horrible ice cream, he's no, I didn't say you made horrible. Well, ice you're cream. technically correct. I said it was awful ice cream. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he says I make awful ice cream. Uh, actually, I make great ice cream, and we have at our website. What is it now, Ken? 51 or 52 videos? 52 videos on YouTube that you can get to from emerythompson.com of different flavors. You can see how to make different products. Plus, there's about 40 hours of this banter back and forth of me and Jeff showing you up here how to make different products. And um, there's one little secret about those videos, which I like to tell people I did this on purpose. You watch those and you learn and you come away with the same impression that Jeff did. If that idiot can make ice cream, imagine <laughs> what I could do. Well, I didn't plan it that way, it just came out. Uh, I am not as great an ice cream maker as he. So we've got our vanilla in and we've got our mix and I'm gonna start this up. I'm gonna take this up, uh, well, we're at full speed. I'm gonna run it at that. And then I'm gonna pour in my grape nuts. Hi, sweetie. Can they see her on camera? I didn't want the audience to think I was getting, uh, you know, over overt with one of the ladies in the audience, you know. I was saying hi, sweet, because Paul is watching. Uh, I was saying hello to the dog. And just pour them in. Don't try this with any other machine. They'll void your warranty because their barrels aren't as thick as ours. Ours are six times thicker than anyone else's and you don't want to go uh, ruining the barrel and the drive system. But it sure won't hurt our machine. Now comes the fun part. You physically can't do this with any other machine on the market because their openings up here narrow down to about that much. You have to puree everything before you throw it in the machine. Now, I was asked uh, during the break about bananas and I have an interesting story about bananas. Um, I had a hard time getting these uh, ripe because bananas in the supermarket are green and so I had to push these to uh, ripen. But even so, that banana is perfect for eating right now, but it's not the best for ice cream. Uh, the best bananas for ice cream is the more ripe they get, the sweeter they are, the more intense the flavor. So if these bananas were brown and ugly, uh, they would be much better for the ice cream. They would be a much more intense flavor. So I think I'm really smart and I go to the public supermarket, the big chain down here in Florida, and I say to the green grocer, uh, you know what, those brown bananas, you can't sell them. Nobody wants them. Give them to me for half price. And he goes, okay, fine. So I put that on a tape and I get a call from uh, Gary of Gary's Ice Cream up in Chelmsford, Mass. And Gary says, oh, you think you're so smart? I go to the greengrocer and I say, and I say to the greengrocer, you not only can't sell those brown bananas, but you're going to have to throw them out 
and they're going to take up space in your dumpster, which is going to cost you money. I'll let you pay me to take those bananas off your hands. Now you go, boy, I've, I've met a master. Do we have a spatula I could use? A spatula? Uh, you know, the plastic ones. The yeah, right chip. here. Thank you. What's this for? That's to throw away. We have garbage cans here. Well, it looks here. bad when I throw them on the ground. We have garbage cans here. <laughs> like you said, I build machines. That's my job. You, does your job include, do you have an ice cream scoop anywhere? An ice cream scoop? I just said that. <laughs> There's an echo in here. Do you have an ice cream scoop? Uh, maybe, Paul. Yeah, I thought we saw one this morning, right here. Oh, okay, here. No, that's a spade. No, I got one. If this you're doing Bed Bath and Beyond, yeah, probably. <laughs> if you're doing Italian ices, these are great. Uh, a spade, maybe one less curved than that, because you can uh, get the ice, put it into the squeeze cup, and then shave off the four corners, and you uh, have a nice presentation. And they just feed right into the machine. You can't do this anywhere else. What are you making? Grape nuts ice cream. Grape nuts. Um, the reason it's important that I can put these in is we put, as I told you, haagen Ben & Jerry's, Breyers, Bluebell, Hershey's, uh, you name it, we put them into business. And they did not start off as multinational corporations. They started off as ma and pa businesses. It was Reuben Madison, his mother, Ben Cohen and, and Jerry, I forgot Jerry's last name, and uh, Friendly's, all these people, Breyer, um, Baskin Robbins, uh, we have machines with. Um, all these people started off small and then they grew and they grew and they grew. Well that's good and that's bad. I mean they grow and the owners make a lot of money selling out to a big corporation and then they retire. Uh, I, I would go nuts. I am not going to sit on the beach for the rest of my life doing nothing. Uh, so I'm not ever going to go that route. But uh, as they get to a certain point which is about 250,000 gallons a year, that's 250,000, that's a lot. They switch over to a machine that's made in the USA called a continuous freezer. It's a, a narrow tube about like that and it's from here to the wall and it makes a thousand gallons an hour. But it only makes vanilla. That's all it can do. You can't put anything into the machine. So they have at the end, here's all this ice cream coming out, thousand gallons an hour and right here is a forty thousand dollar machine uh, called a fruit feeder. And so it injects the flavor into the ice cream. So, if you were making strawberry ice cream batch versus commercial, uh, the commercial ice cream is vanilla and then we're injecting strawberries into it. When you look in the container, yeah, it looks like strawberry ice cream. But when you make batch ice cream with an Emery Thompson and we're the only people that you can pour everything in, uh, for every particle of dairy mix, there is a particle of strawberry next to it or a particle of banana. So your flavor is gonna be far more intense than any commercial ice cream. So what happens with a lot of commercial businesses uh, is they, they grow and they grow and they grow as homemade and then they jump to commercial and then people start going, oh gee, I remember when that ice cream was uh, 10 years ago, it was much better than today. And what happens, one of you comes along and says, I can make a better homemade ice cream. It's the wheel of marketing. You get so big that all of a sudden someone comes in and says, I can do it the old fashioned way. And they put you out of business and then they start their journey on the wheel. Um, so our batch freezers are gonna make you a better ice cream than anywhere else. Be simple fact, <laughs> because you can put everything in. And I think I've got everything in here I need. Let's see, we put in the uh, bananas and the vanilla and the grape nuts. That should do it. Okay. So you've got enough for your next thing. I'm all set. Any questions I can answer so far? Yes, uh, I have what, a question. What you, would you say? They're like a, are you a painting or are you an audience? I have a, a uh, my jokes. I have a question. Yes. Uh, the other person who made ices didn't measure, remember? You can say his name. Rod, he didn't <laughs> measure. Um, I, I advise against that. Uh, I thought that was incredibly too sweet and it had the potential for being a good product, but he didn't measure. Uh, in my books, in my, as a matter of fact, I would tell you all get index cards and uh, some of you will get to see how you make a recipe tomorrow, but. 
When you get the recipe down, put them on index cards and then laminate the cards, keep them in a box file alphabetically. And when you're making ice cream, just take out it and go by it. None of this eyeballing stuff because your customers, he goes to one ice cream parlor up in Boston and he wants their mint chip every summer. And damn, it better taste like it did last summer. And that's the same way with your ice cream stores. Yes? Uh, regarding the strawberries or cherries or peaches you put in, on a 20 quart memory Thomas mix, you're making a quart uh, batch of uh, peaches. What's your recommended um, ratio between putting the peaches in versus the mix? The question is how much uh, flavor do you put in? Um, I have some general rules for the way I make it, and like I said, I modified my vanilla according to Jeff, so I want to hear what he has to say after I speak. Uh, my general rules are on the 24 quart machine, which is two three gallon tubs, I put in uh, two quarts of flavors. So if I'm using bananas, it's going to be uh, two quarts of uh, bananas, it's going to be two quarts of strawberries, and I put one quart into the machine for my fruit flavor. I'm blindfolded and I taste it and it's strawberry. Take the blindfold off and you don't see chunks. So I would add my second quart of strawberries as it's coming out because you see it and you eat with your eyes. So I have the fruit flavor and the fruit identity, but two quarts. If it's Oreo cookies, if it's chips, I'm using uh, two pounds. So two, two, and my old rule used to be if it was an extract, use a third more than the manufacturer says. Now I've changed it uh, to uh, an ounce a gallon, at least for vanilla. I'm, I haven't tested that theory with mint. It might be too strong. How do you, do you have any general rules that you do? Yes, uh, you, can't, you can't answer that question because I was talking to a guy during the lunch break and he's looking to go into the business and I said, do you have a passion for ice cream and do you know what good ice cream is? He said, no. And in my opinion, that's a big roadblock. I can only make ice cream the way I think it tastes good. You can't go by a book because what he thinks is good may not be what you think is good. Even my recipe books, I tell you, you know, taste it. Taste it before you finish the process. With these machines, I put everything in and I start it up and I'm continually putting a spoon in there, not the same spoon, and tasting it. And I can still vary the product, a little more sugar, a little more flavor, another banana, whatever it is. Uh, but if it's not what you think is good ice cream, don't sell it. Uh, it's just that simple. You have to develop a palate. There's a way to do that too, but that's another story. Can I borrow your file card for a second? Jeff was dead on uh, about the file cards. I, I have one extra thing I add about that, and that is regarding employees. Uh, you get to the point where your business grows, and you, you got to have a day off. You got to you know take a vacation. So you train a trusted employee how to make ice cream. Don't worry about stealing. Uh, don't worry about. Uh, them stealing your formulas, it's no big deal because they can go buy Jeff's book just like you did <laughs> and then they'll make it to their own personal taste. So there's no secret formulas locked up in a vault. But you've got it written down on a fi file card. Again, I said about McDonald's, uh, lousy hamburger but lousy no matter where you go in the world. We want <laughs> great and we want it great this year, last year, and, and next year. So you've got the cheesecake recipe all written down here. You're teaching someone how to make ice cream and the guy takes it upon himself <clears throat> to say, ah, Jeff, he doesn't know anything he's doing. He's putting in too much cheesecake. I'm gonna cut back on it. He's just changed your formula, the one that all the customers love. If I find out about that, I, I tell the employee you're fired. No, excuse me, first we break his kneecaps, then we take him out into the street and we shoot him, and then we fire him because that will ruin my business if there's inconsistency. If this machine isn't as good as it was 40 years ago or better, I'm in trouble. Same thing with the recipe. So you teach people this is your recipe, you don't change it no matter what. I don't care what your taste is. This is my taste, this is what I like, and this is what we're gonna sell. And you impart that on them and you just say, that's the only grounds around here for uh, getting fired. If the guy's got a girlfriend and he's talking on the phone and the machine freezes up and everything's gone to hell, 
you don't fire him. You say, listen, it's an Emory Thompson. We call Steve or we call one of his engineers. We'll get it up and running in five minutes. It's only a piece of machinery. Big deal. But if someone walks out and says, I don't like the ice cream, you're finished. Paul and I went to a restaurant the other night uh, over in Palm Beach, and the food was absolutely horrible. And we'd been going there for years. And I called up the, uh, the restaurant owner, and I told him what was wrong with it. He said, oh, I'm really sorry. Uh, my chef just walked out on me, and uh, that shouldn't have been served to you. I said, that's no excuse. I'm not coming back, because you have only one chance every time I walk in to get it right. So Jeff's, with the uh, file cards, is really, really an important part of the business. Almost. Okay. Another, another minute. All right. <laughs> 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 Any questions? Uh, are you enjoying yourself? Don't eat too much of this ice cream because then I make something after this. Obviously better. Ah, good question, but let's talk about a little broader topic. Fresh fruit, frozen fruit. Forget the, the uh, jar stuff because, you know, I don't do that. But I never use fresh fruit because it's inconsistent. Uh, I go to Restaurant Depot and I buy the bags of frozen fruit, frozen cherries, very expensive, but it is what it is. Uh, but at least every bag is going to be the same and those recipes that I make will be consistent. Uh, so I don't use uh, fresh fruit at all. You can use frozen fruit or you can use, uh, well, I don't use canned fruit, but anything that's consistent. Uh, I think frozen fruit's your best bet. The, uh, th this video goes out to uh, people in 172 countries, and so they don't really know everything that's going on in Florida. When I first went to school down here back in the uh, very late 60s, uh, early 70s, um, the orange crop, I found out, starts, the oranges start uh, turning ripe and show up on the market in late November, and it goes all the way to the end of March. In late November, those oranges are as bitter and awful as you can imagine. And in, in late March, they're like eating candy, they're so sweet. So a uh, Floridian doesn't buy oranges uh, right now, they're, they're, they're too tart. So when you want to make a, say, an orange cream ice, uh, I use Minimade frozen concentrate, uh, the country style, because it's got some pulp in it. Because what Minimade does, and what you, all your orange juice, when you buy orange juice in the supermarket, uh, it has been blended. They, they're not going to say, no, we won't buy the oranges in November. They take November, December, January, February, March, and they blend it all together so that they have a consistency of taste. So no matter when you buy Minimate or Tropicana, it always tastes the same. Um, you don't have that luxury with fresh fruit. Ice cream's ready. Okay. Some, uh, so we're going to turn off the refrigeration and open the gate. Um, as I mentioned before, strawberries are all over the place. And what happens in Florida, which drives us nuts, is all the good fruit gets sent north. We get all the seconds and thirds because they can get more money for uh, the fresh fruit, the fresh strawberries, the fresh oranges, the grapefruits. They can get more money in Chicago than they can in Tampa. So you saw how fast that came out. And this is at 100% uh, overrun. So that's the maximum amount of air. So you'll get to taste that and see what you think. And it's certainly going to be crunchy. The other thing about our machinery that's important is the discharge gates are very large. Um, other machines on the market, they have a very small opening or they have grids in the way. We do have a guard that goes on this machine uh, just like these. They're offset from the machine. Can you see that over here, Ken? They're off, the, all our guards are offset so they have no interfering with the product coming out. Let's say you're broiling a steak. You're broiling a steak. And uh, the steak takes eight minutes to be ready, medium rare, but it takes you four and a half minutes to pull it out of the oven. The first slice is medium rare. The last slice is charred because it continues to uh, cook. In this case, it continues to freeze for a bit, but it's also taking on a lot more air 
So you end up with a tub that uh, in a slow machine like that, like a Capigiani, this part of the ice cream is at 55% overrun and this part is much higher because it's had so long in the machine. So just as important as being able to put nuts and cookies in, you want to get that ice cream out fast. What gets me, Jeff, is they use their negative and they say, oh, but it comes out so slow, you can decorate it as it's coming out. No, you That's want it out baloney. fast. You're ruining the product. Come on up and try this. And I'll be first because I've never had it and we'll see if it's edible. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that is really good. Uh, Thank you. I don't think I've ever had grape nuts. Well, you're going to have to and try it. Get in the cereal. No. <laughs> They're really hard. Are they anything to do with grape or nuts? No. They do. They're a wheat. A grape nut is a grape nut is actually wheat. Yeah, it's not a nut and it's not a grape. But who's going to buy wheat nuts? Because you've been seeing low air, the question uh, is, why did I choose the higher Do me a favor, grab content? your own plates, I because can't Because you've grab. been seeing the low air content all day and I wanted you to see the difference. Okay. Um, because of the texture of the grapes Nope, no, nope. it was just I wanted to show you the versatility. That's good. I haven't tried it yet. Oh. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all the big ones. I have the 40. Oh, uh, no, the 40 does not come on wheels. Oh, yeah? Too big. I've never had it. I'm a raisin brand guy. To move it. We can sell you wheels, but there's just no reason. It's made to put on wheels. Like the holes are drilled. You have to drill the holes in. No, it's all drilled. It's all drilled. Okay. Yeah. So you can even add them later. Yeah. For our frost plant, it's going to go. I have to move it. It's an extra pasteurizer, so I have to move it. Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can do it. They're not cheap wheels for an interesting reason. Yeah, <laughs> you can go out and buy a wheel. It's, it's 1,200 pounds. I'm looking at it to see if it's one. done. And you can buy a wheel that will support uh, the thickness pounds. of it. So, yeah, one, two, three, four, there's 2,000 pounds. Oh, yeah, you'll you see. Okay. You'll see. But the way it was you'll taught know how to, to me make in it. physics is you have a woman okay. wearing high heels. You, you and need? She's standing like this, and those Here. heels oh. will support her. If she leans back like this, now she's putting 70,000 pounds per square inch. Poor woman only weighs 125. She's putting 70,000 pounds per square inch on that little tip of the heel. So it's quite a challenge to make a high heel that doesn't break. So if you've got a wheel that isn't strong enough, it'll hold the weight of the machine. But the second you move it, now you're changing the, the, the weight dimensions uh, dramatically. And if you go over a bump, you know, all bets are off. So we use really heavy wheels. So what would we the would air just, do? We, uh, in our milk it whips it. Yeah. Just think about whipped cream. Oh, yeah. It just whips it. We create the milk. We pay with 40 pounds. And the wheels are rated for a certain thing. But as we said, when you all in one spot, the wheels don't do that. <laughs> they, they cave in. They cave out. You know, except for those hard crunchy things, this is good. Thank you. Ken, you want to try it? Okay. Everybody, you haven't met Ken. He's been behind the camera. This is Ken Putt, our systems manager. Uh, when you order up the, uh, when, you, when you write into us and ask for information, Ken processes that, gets it out, he keeps all our computers running, he produces all the uh, videos and uh, edits them, so when you see this on TV, there'll be a little wave from Jeff, but that's the last you'll see of him. <laughs> Actually, he'll be a big part of it. What do you think? All right, what, what do you all think? And, and don't tell me it's great because it's free. It's growing. No, I want to know what they think so I don't make it again if it's awful. It's, aside from those crunchy it's things, it's good. Yeah. I don't know. Excuse me? If it was a little bit ripe with bananas, then it would be perfect. Okay. But it is good. Okay. So, better bananas. I like yes. It. I like the crunchy stuff. It's softer. Um, I would imagine that it sits. Yeah. So, no, someone told me that after about four or five days, they get mushy. Oh, so you just yeah, serve it and then four or five days later you eat it. Huh? No, you have to sell it within four or five days. Oh. So it doesn't get mushy. I think a better combination would be like a banana and almond. But then it wouldn't be grape nuts ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Bananas and almonds. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask you a question. I was thinking of adding another ingredient to it. And that is, uh, this is, 
the usual brand name is Coco Lopez, but this is the same idea. This cream of coconut, very sweet that you add to drinks. What would you think about adding coconut to this? I've got two, three, Great five, idea. five no's. No. no. Okay. Most no's and one yes. Doesn't matter. If you make it and you like it, it's a winner. Yeah, but I got to sell it. I got to give it to my own laws even worse. Sell machines. That's always good. <sighs> yeah. That's true. Maybe. We have a jar in the store, a big uh, few gallon jar, and it says on it flavor suggestions. And then there's uh, little slips of paper next to it with a pen, and people put uh, their suggested flavor and their name. And there's a sign up there if we make your flavor, you get a free pint. And it's led to some great flavors. So wherever you store is, I suggest you do it because. If you see one thing, you know, I want a rubber ice cream, you know, it doesn't matter. But if you see, if you start to see a trend with more chocolates, more bananas, more, more fruits, more whatever, then you know you got to maybe lean towards that because it's something that they'll buy. I hear you've got another list up there that says you're dead to me. <laughs> and these are the people uh, who didn't like your ice cream. I get, it's blank oh, at the oh, moment. Oh, I get no respect <laughs> out of the guy, I tell you. Do you need a machine to make this? No. Okay. No. He's. I have a question uh, since people brought up nuts. Do you guys tend to shy away from them because of the allergies, things like that? Because of nuts? Yeah, because of allergies. Oh, I got an interesting story about nuts. I, I was talking about. You to get some. a chair. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. The, the question is what about using nuts in ice cream? Well, the only problem is peanuts. And I, I can't verify this story, but I find it uh, interesting enough to look into. Is, you know, everybody in this audience is over 15 years old. And we grew up. You know, the usual way, drinking water out of a garden faucet and, you know, ate our pound of dirt and everything else. Well, I was talking to one lady who was buying two of these, one for nuts and one without nuts. And I said, listen, I'm happy to sell you two machines, but I feel guilty. This is a waste of time and money. Um, and she said, no, because the school where I supply the ice creams to, the school board absolutely insists that you cannot have any kind of nuts. You have to sign an affidavit. And I, I thought this was just going overboard. And I said to her, is this just, you know, the 20-year-old the generation raising kids just getting a little bit absurd? And she said, no, it's a real thing. She had talked, she was a pharmacist, so she knew what she was talking about. And she had talked to multiple allergists. And the consensus that they are leaning towards is the children growing up today are so used to using hand sanitizers and everybody's using Clorox uh, on their countertops and you know everything is so sanitary that they're not being exposed to uh, germs and it is coming out in children as a peanut allergy. She said you can't predict where something's going to pop out but she said the peanut allergy in children is absolutely real. It can kill them. Uh, it's a real problem. So a lot of ice cream parlors uh, they don't ban the peanuts, but boy, they sure put up signs saying that we use peanuts in our uh, processing. So then the sanitation would work in the machine? The sanitation does work in the machine. There's no problem there. But you can't convince that of someone. So you've, you, it comes down to the lawyers. You have to protect yourself. The easiest way to do it is don't make ice cream with peanuts. Use, well, cashews, use cashews, use pistachio nuts. Um, well, peanut butter ice cream is very popular. I sell nutty very fudge, popular. very popular. And people ask me all the time, do you, you know, do you have nuts in your machine? And I say no. But if you have peanut butter? Yes, I lie. Oh. <laughs> you're you're going to be able to edit this out, Ken? Well, Ken, because you can the, edit this out. the Clorox, I mean, Clorox is going to kill anything. You know, right? Tighten the noose, why don't you? <laughs> yeah, it's all right. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, the Clorox is going to kill anything. Uh, so it, it will. Yeah, but it will. You have to be rinsing your machine out after every peanut. Well, sure, but you Absolutely. do anyway. I mean, I do. The, the trick of it, and, and if you've ever worked with peanut butter ice cream, it's which your you may last not have ice cream it, of the day. It's your last ice cream. It's horrible. It it's sticks awful. to everything. It takes, whereas we can might, clean up the machine five minutes, peanut butter, 15 minutes or longer. Yeah, whereas you might rinse with two buckets of water after nutty fudge, you might five. Uh, yeah. But if you sanitize afterwards, uh, to me, it's an illogical law. It's a law that's outdated because nobody's taken the time to investigate the newness of it. But the Clark's going to kill anything. 
I mean, I, I haven't had a problem. Now that it's on TV, of course, I'll get sued tomorrow. <laughs> well, you don't cater to children either. What's that? You don't serve to children. Well, people have nut allergies. There are adult nuts, too. Not, not, <laughs> not as many. No, but it happens. It happens. So, right. uh, you done? <coughs> if you are. You no, I'm ready something? to roll. Good. Go for it. But they're still eating ice cream, you know? It's, okay. They'll find a way. Uh, so, I sell only one thing. I sell ice cream. Uh, not that I haven't made great Italian ices and great cream ice. Anyone know what cream ice is? Wow. Wow. Um, Amazing. Cream ice. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. I lived in Fort Lauderdale for 20 years. My neighbor across the street, Evan, young guy, maybe 20 something years old, decided to open an ice cream store, but he didn't have, he didn't make it an ice cream store. He has an Emory Thompson, uh, but he decided to sell what's called cream ice. Now, if you take Italian ices with all their exotic flavors and you add a little bit of dairy, you have a product that is amazing. And if you really want to make money, I always said if I started this business over again, I would make it cream ice. He sells 55 flavors of cream ice, and they're unbelievable. Exotic flavors, you know, pistachio caramel and, and wild huckleberry, all these great flavors of cream ice with chips and nuts and fruits in it. And he, there's a line every night out the door. Cream ice, very interesting. If you uh, want to look at a website sometime, look at Ralph's Italian Ices uh, in Staten Island, R-A-L-P-H. Ralph has got to be the king of cream ices, uh, sells yeah. more than anybody. He runs 17 of my largest machines at one location and 15 at a, a second location in Jersey making cream ices. They really are delicious. They're great. And they're so and, easy. And I made cream ice at my store about maybe a year ago. And it was amazing. I made Oreo cookie cream ice. And it was terrific. And so I decided to, of course, like any new product, give it away and then start selling it. So the first night I, I put it on tables. I have tables of 6, 8, 10, 12. And I put a bunch on the tables. And then I came back later and hardly anything was missing. And I was curious because it was delicious. I mean, I made a great cream ice. So I took it out. And the next day I made a chocolate chip cream ice, vanilla chocolate chip cream ice, and it was outstanding. And I put it out and around, I came back, nobody was eating it. So I asked one of my good customers, I said, Bobby, what's wrong? Isn't it good? He said, oh, it's good. But next to your ice cream, it doesn't have the body, the creaminess, the richness, so it pales by comparison. If all they had was cream ice, I'd be driving a Bentley because the profit markup is ridiculous. But next to my ice cream, which they've grown used to, which is a thick, creamy, flavor-laden product, this, this was watery, when in fact it's not. So I can't sell cream ice because I sell ice cream. Uh, I don't think you can sell both because there's such a dramatic difference in them. Boy, the room is really quiet when I talk. You know, I, I hear the machinery behind me. So one of the things I sell besides ice cream is a milkshake. You got to sell shakes, shakes and malts. And I make, without, a, without exception, the best milkshake in the world. Uh, and it's very simple, and that's what we're going to make now. We're going to make milkshakes, and you're all going to have some. Now, uh, I have 10 other than my 35 flavors, which you can get a shake in any of those flavors. The girls will do that up front. I have a 30 foot bar in the back that sells cappuccino and, and lattes and espressos. And I have 10 specialty shakes. And the shakes are Snickers, M&M, Oreo, uh, uh, I can't think, but 10 specialty shakes. And they're made with Custard, vanilla custard that I make myself too. So, tell you a secret how to make the world's greatest shake. It's so simple. Put Snickers <laughs> bars and Milky Way bars and any other candy you want in the freezer. And when somebody orders a shake, let's say they order a Snicker shake. This is so cool. They order a Snicker shake. You go to the freezer right in front of them and you take out two Snickers bars, frozen like a rock and you undo them and you take two Snickers bars and throw them in this amazing machine. This is a, uh, I'll sell these after the show. But this is a Ninja. And what makes, I have a Vitamix at home that I used to start the business with. It's collecting dust now because this 
has three blades running around it. So you take a rock hard Snickers bar, two of them, drop them in there, put it on, it'll make, it'll make powder out of them, just like this. I took this right from the counter in my store this morning. It'll make powder. And you take five ounces of this, which is coincidentally one of these, put it in here. So uh, should we start with the Milky Way? I have Milky Way and M&M &M with me. M&M. &M. M &M. <laughs> so the M&M, &M, same thing. I put them in the freezer and I take a three and a half pound bag and I put them in the Ninja and I crank it up till it becomes dust, dust. And you add five and a half ounces of whatever you want. In this case, it'll be M&M. And you do this right in front of the customer, it's a, it's a gas, they love it. So we're gonna take M&M, which is just crushed M&Ms, that's all it is, right into the Ninja. <laughs> the Ninja is like an infomercial. <laughs> and actually, before we do that, I made a mistake. I did put a line on here so that I know how much, you know what this is, right? This is the ice cream mix, 10% ice cream mix and I put it in up to the line. We have three of these going and they all have a line on the side. And then you put in M&Ms or whatever. I, I keep M&Ms, Snickers and Milky Ways in the freezer and I can make them right on the spot. When we get backed up, I use what's on hand in the stock. So that's five ounces of that. Actually, it wasn't totally full. Ah, little do you know. And then I take my custard and I put a couple of scoops of custard in there. This is vanilla custard that I make, although the vanilla part is just a, a misnomer actually. It's just generic custard. And then, uh, and then you get it to go. Ah. <laughs> this model is an older model. You have to hold the handle down. This was a $20 flea market find. I have the two new modern ones that are $99 or something. Now, some might say it's an expensive milkshake, right? Because I'm using uh, the ice cream mix and candy bars. Um, but I got to tell you, people come in just for the milkshakes. And they, they come in, some, some guy comes in nightly for milkshakes. Uh, they're that good. Now, the first, hmm? One size. One size, six dollars. <laughs> and they get about 32 ounces. Uh, I give them a, you know those metal malted cups? Uh, they get one of those and a sidecar. So this is the first batch that's going to make a bunch of these. The next batch I'll make bigger so we can all try it if you want it. You should taste it. It's going to make you a lot of money. So come up and get them. And this is M&M. &M. Yeah, I will. Okay, good thought. And the next one will make, uh, what do I have here? A uh, Milky Way. And you can make them thicker or thinner depending upon how you like it. Some of my customers want a spoon to stand up in it. So that's what I make for them. So again, uh, how many ounces did you say? I don't know. Up to the black line. <laughs> Actually, we'll make a double uh, so that everybody can have it. A double. And we'll make uh, Milky Way. Everybody like Milky Way? Yep. Milky Way. How can you not like Milky Way? 
It's Milky Way ice cream. Now, as I said, we make all the flavors of our ice cream. We make 35 different flavors of shakes, and the girls are busy with them all night. But I usually tend the bar area, and uh, I make these um, for everybody. So now we need two of these, right? Wake up. Because we're making a double. And you can take any candy bar. You can take a Payday. You can take a, a Milky Way, M&M's, Reese's, anything you want. And of course, you've noticed by now that I don't have, uh, I don't use any vanilla or chocolate. I don't sell vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream or strawberry ice cream or anything. Uh, and I don't use a base for anything of vanilla or chocolate. Did I put one in already? Yes. Okay, and then ice cream. In this case, custard, but you can use any ice cream that you want in your store. I just, I like my custard. It makes a nice, uh, I don't sell the custard either. It's just for milkshakes. What? How dare you? <laughs> Are you kidding? After all I've been through, you think I would take some powdered mix? No, and I, didn't think so, but I make, I tell you what, I take two dozen egg yolks uh, and, uh, and ice cream mix, and I heat the ice cream mix till it's uh, almost a boil, simmering. And then I scramble the yolks and very slowly, girls know from cooking, very slowly you add it to that as you're whisking. And I put in uh, van vanilla beans, you know, the pods. Uh, we didn't get into that, but I will if you want. So imagine, imagine the marketing potential of being able to make a milkshake out of any candy bar. That's pretty cool. I mean, a clock bar, Baby Ruth, uh, any candy bar in the world. Freeze them, throw them in the Ninja. It wouldn't be possible without the Ninja. Ninja's a great thing. I mean, I, I'm buying more because I know they're going to change it and go out of business and all that stuff. Okay. Frozen, does it take much longer for you to blend? Or? It takes two seconds. Two seconds to grind them up. And by the way, in my book, you'll see the recipe for M&M ice cream. Uh, and everybody asks me every night, do I use a vanilla base or a chocolate base? And the answer is no. I grind up M&Ms and add them to the mix with some vanilla, and that's it. Okay, let's have some M&M milkshake. I used to make my M&M by throwing the M&Ms into vanilla ice cream. Yeah. That's... And it was not anywhere near as good as Jeff's. The grinding up the M&Ms and then putting it in the machine gets all the flavor going. After this, we're going to uh, wind it down. If anybody would like a tour of the factory, I can show you around. Uh, on the we have yeah. free Snickers. DVDs that the we number give one out candy if we haven't mailed them to you. And uh, we can put those together uh, before you leave. Um, all our machinery and all the recipes are up on our website, uh, as well as our price list. I'm always amazed that uh, other companies won't put up the price of their machines. Uh, you have to spend months trying to get a price out. We put them all right there for you to see. And uh, any questions, you can call me. Um, if you want to write this down, this is my private home telephone number. It's area code 914. 643-7391. Now you can call that. Uh, I start about 6 in the morning and go till 10 at night, but the phone is open from 6 until 9, and then Ken magically uh, blocks it uh, so that no one gets through, especially not my children, and, uh, or other relatives. I've got to be more expansive on that. But uh, if you had a question on the weekend that uh, couldn't wait until uh, Monday morning, call me. Uh, He's usually on his boat. I'm usually on my boat, but uh, I get good reception out there too. And, um, uh, and you know, call me anytime. Nobody else in the industry has ever dared to give out their home private phone number, but I've been doing it for years, and uh, it's very interesting. People uh, don't call 
unless they have a, uh, a question that they want to know today. And it doesn't have to be about operating the machine. Sometimes someone needs to know, you know, how much is it going to cost to make this? I'm doing my projections today. Well, call me. There's no restriction to it. But during business hours, Monday through Friday, of course, you call the factory, 718-588-7300. That's all right. Seven one eight five eight eight seven three hundred. And if you want to get in touch with Jeff, uh, the spelling is is unique. So uh, don't think you're just going to spell out X hippie. It's X H I P P E E at AOL dot com. I didn't know anybody was still on AOL, but it's xhippie <laughs> at aol.com, and Jeff will get right back to you. He's very good about uh, answering emails. That's what one of the many things I like about Jeff is uh, you don't send him an email and then wait for months for a reply. He, he gets right back to you and answers your questions. So I, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, this has been a lot of fun for us. And um, anything you need, just call us. I'll give you a tour when you're ready of the factory. And those of you who are coming tomorrow or who want a copy of the book, just come over here because I need to go over some stuff. And if you need uh, copies of the videos, just see Ken afterwards. And uh, he's got them in a package and he can hand them to you. Otherwise, those of you watching this video, uh, there's a link where you can uh, send us your information, uh, an email, a mailing address, and we will mail you uh, our DVDs. And of course, you can see all the different ones uh, at the website. Jeff, thanks for coming. Thank you, that boss. Was a lot of fun. Thank you. Enjoy it. Uh, uh, this is for you and Paula. That's M&M &M milkshake. Oh, thank you. I'll put in the fridge. Who wants to see the factory? Come on with me. And it only comes two ways. It comes USA and export. Uh, so there isn't any uh, big variations. The other machines are custom made because we don't know what voltage it's going into until we uh, get the order. So these are all built here. Um, This is a 40. This is the world's largest production batch freezer. This is the largest batch freezer in the world. This makes four tubs in the same time as the other machines. And uh, it's all the same construction. It's just bigger, a lot bigger. It weighs 1,200 pounds, and we build this to uh, any voltage in the world. Um, this is what it starts looking like. Uh, we do everything here. Uh, we, build, we take angle iron and build the frame and then send it out to be powder coated in the, within the uh, building, within the um, airport. We're at an airport here, and my buying practices are I buy within the airport uh, goods and services, and then I buy in the town, then I buy in the state of Florida, and then I buy in the United States, and that's where it ends. Uh, so it's, it's made in the USA. And these are all machines that have just been finished over the last few days and are getting ready to go out. Uh, just waiting for people to send in their final payment and then we ship them out. Uh, this is a 24 right here. You can see it's the same size as what we ran today, only the barrel is twice as deep. The uh, compressors and motors aren't in it yet. Um, it's getting ready to be made as an infinite overrun. It's got the cutout. And these things weigh about 800 pounds. That's, that's uh, 1,200 pounds. When they're shipping within the United States, we bolt them down to a skid and then put a very heavy box over it. You could never crush that box. When we ship outside the United States, uh, we build a full wood crate for it. Uh, but most times shipping outside the United States, surprisingly because of the unions, uh, it's almost as cheap to ship by air, four day air anywhere in the world as it is by boat. Hmm. Because shipping it to Los Angeles or Miami and then waiting for the unions to load it on a ship just raises the cost so high that they won't even take anything now that isn't over 2,000 pounds. Uh, so uh, ship travel has pretty much disappeared. Everything we do is by air. Wow. So it's good. It means that your machine, once it's built, is going to be in your building, no matter where you are in the world, in about four days. And when they get to your building, we have to do a type of assembly? No, no. There's no assembly at all. 
there's a power cord coming out and you attach it to your power supply. If it's a water-cooled machine, it's got a water in and a water out like a washing machine and it comes with the high pressure hoses and that's it. You need, you should use a qualified electrician. You know, too many people use their Uncle Louie uh, who once changed the light switch and uh, you know, this is uh, a $24,000 machine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, leave it to someone who changes light switches. Well, what's the electrician doing? If you already have a 220 line, you just plug it in? Because most people don't have the 220 oh, line. Okay, but if you have a 220, if you, it's don't, a, you don't need an electrician at that point? If it's a proper size breaker, Okay. And every, and usually, uh, you know, they most of them these come without a plug, because there's about 30 different combinations of 220 oh, okay. plug, no, and so you need yeah. you yeah. need no, you. you need a qualified electrician. Okay. Also, there's little nuances. You actually have to read the instruction book. If you have a water cooled machine, you want to hook up the water lines before the electric, because once you power it up, the compressor comes on, right. and it needs to be cooled yeah, by water. Yeah. yeah. So. It's, it's like anything, read the instruction book, and since we're guys, we don't read instruction books. Yeah. That's the what's problem. The, lead time for instruction uh, the countertops are immediate delivery, and overseas, though, they can be either immediate or about seven weeks. Because, see, overseas, uh, on the small 220s, we run on two power lines. 115 and 150 makes up our 230. Over in uh, a lot of European countries, and Africa, and, and the Far East, it's one line of 220. So it's a whole different compressor that goes in there. We don't build anything. The Italians build machines where they build it their way and then you have to modify it. You have to buy a transformer, which is a real bad idea, or a phase changer. And you're looking at $3,000 for something that's gonna burn out in three years. We build it from the ground up to match our voltage. I wish you could see this building on a sunny day. We built it, I designed it with all these bay doors everywhere. There's a big runway out there, 7,200 feet, and uh, the light just comes pouring in, fresh air from across the fields. It's, it's just beautiful. Uh, we'll go down this way. Excuse me. So these are all 20s getting ready to go, be built. Here's that copper I was talking about, nine times more expensive than aluminum. I once owned a BMW. I decided I didn't like it. It was too Spartan compared to the Lexus. And it had, they went so far as to take the aluminum uh, Freon lines for the air conditioning system in the BMW and spray paint them copper color <laughs> so that you would think it was more expensive. That's pure copper. That is what we call inert. It cannot wear out. It cannot leak. It will be around three, four hundred years from now. Aluminum will only last uh, 7 to 11 years or 8 to 11 years and then it's shot so you can spend 24,000 with me or you can spend 30,000 with Capigiani but 45 years later my machine will still be running and theirs will be in the trash heap in no more than 11 years so to me it's a no-brainer the cylinders that we build I'll bring it over to you ah, pretty heavy this is six times thicker than anybody else in the industry uh, what the rest of the industry does is they take a thin sheet of stainless steel of the gauge that we use uh, for panels and they stamp it. Well, when you stamp something, uh, you need a very large machine. Something about two stories high would be needed to stamp something like this. But it thins out the stainless even, even further. So you can only use a, a very thin stainless steel to make a barrel if you're going to stamp it. It makes it one piece and they're finished and it's dirt cheap. What we do is we take plate stainless steel and we take the sheets, cut them, and we roll them on a machine. We weld it and then we weld the back plate on. And of course, anybody who knows welding knows that the weld is actually stronger than the metal it's joining. So that barrel is forever and it's so thick and so sturdy that uh, you can put all the nuts and cookies and candies in it. And Capigiani and all the others, Electrofreeze, the rest of them, uh, Stolting, they will have pages in their instruction book saying your warranty is voided if you put nuts and cookies into the machine. The front door on this machine, which I'll show you, is so heavy, we have to put a solid brass ring around the barrel just to hold the door. Now, the doors have about 25 hours of machining in them. We have a foundry in Wisconsin, and then we put about 25 hours of machining. Feel the weight of that. That's pure stainless steel, and that door is forever. 
Where'd Ken go? Oh, there you are. Oh, hi. I just wanted to show you the door. But that came in as a rough casting, and then we did all this machining on it. So there's never, ever going to be any kind of maintenance on that door. And then uh, these are stands that we've uh, built and then uh, powder coated. All this stuff you see up here, the compressors are bought in the United States, but all the panels you see we make across the street. That's a different operation. But the compressors are all Copeland and uh, made in the USA out in, uh, I think it's Marysville, Ohio. We have a welding department here. These are the uh, 44 quart cylinders. They're just being polished. Uh, before we polish them first and then we grind them uh, and then we uh, wrap the copper tubing on them to make the freezing cylinder. So we have never worn out a freezing cylinder of this welded style. Good afternoon. These are all polished and ready to go on the machine. There's no gasket in there. It's a metal to metal contact. It's all hand ground in there. So on these larger machines, you don't have to worry about any kind of gaskets, but that's all pure stainless steel. A lot of money in that. That's our Rolls Royce emblem and uh, it'll never wear out. This is getting hand polished, the, the freezing cylinder, uh, before it goes out. Every machine that we make, we test for three and a half hours with sugar water. Italian ice is harder on a machine than is uh, ice cream. So we have a big tank of sugar water that we keep recirculating back and every machine gets to this stage and gets tested before it gets shipped out. So we know when it leaves that it's all set up perfectly and working right. So if someone has a question, we know the machine's good. We just have to figure out what uh, we need to advise them on as far as the way they've hooked it up or the way they're running it. U.S. Motors. And that's basically how we do it. The, uh, the other building isn't available for tour. We have uh, CNC machines over there that are all computerized doing machining and, and all, and they're so sensitive that they're all under air conditioning. So we just, and usually, and the weather looks too cold to go outside. <laughs> So that's the tour. If any of you need uh, DVDs or anything, uh, you can ask Ken. I can help you, and I can I'll be in my office. I can answer any questions you might have. But thanks for coming. Thank you. We can go out this way. We're just going to reintroduce everybody, and then I'll turn Hello. 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 Don't you dare put that on. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Ever. <laughs>